Members of the House Freedom Caucus are making it clear that without an agreement to certain terms, they will oppose any spending bill. The group released a statement saying, we refuse to support any such measure that continues Democrats' bloated COVID-era spending and simultaneously fails to force the Biden administration to follow the law and fulfill its most basic responsibilities. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us now with the details. We're already doing this. This is separate from the debt ceiling. Don't blame me, Julie. <laughs> Just the messenger here. Uh, right. This is not the debt ceiling all over again. This is not as serious. And, you know, honestly, I think everybody should just ignore this. Uh, let, the, let the members of Congress who want to fight over these things have their little fight. Uh, and then we'll maybe get back to governing in October or November. But for what it's worth, uh, there are about 30 members of this uh, super conservative group called the House Freedom Caucus. They're all Republicans. Uh, they say they are not going to agree to uh, the spending that's needed to continue government operations after September 30, unless they get concessions on this list of things you see there, they want tougher border security. They actually want uh, to uh, the Biden administration to start building, rebuilding Trump's border wall, among other things, uh, less spending. They're worried about social issues at the Pentagon and so on. So what's probably going to happen is we, we uh, let's call it a 50 percent likelihood there's going to be some kind of government shutdown, which would happen beginning October 1st. That's when the fiscal year begins. Uh, and then these guys have to figure out how to fix this. Now, um, th you know, there are enough Democrats in the House that they could provide the votes that the House would need, along with the Republicans who control the House, to approve spending bills. But they're not going to do that unless they get everything they want. And that's unlikely. So. Um, we're going to just get to this showdown. It's not going to affect markets very much. It's not about whether uh, the U.S. can continue to make its debt payments. It's just another one of these silly fights in Washington. Rick, thanks so much for breaking this down, tracking this so that some of us don't have to every single day. But <laughs> nonetheless, great to hear some of the updates from it. Appreciate it, Rick. Bye, guys. Congress is still on recess, but lawmakers are set to be put to the text, test next month when they return to Capitol Hill. The two sides need to reach a deal on next year's budget by September 30th to avoid a government shutdown. Joining us now for more is Brian Gardner, Stiefel, Chief Washington Policy Strategist. Brian, it's good to see you here. So I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how likely a government shutdown is going to be, whether or not both sides are going to be able to reach a deal before that September 30th deadline. What do you think? I think it's pretty likely. I mean, Speaker McCarthy um, is getting a lot of pressure from the right uh, to shut down the government. Um, he's trying to push back against them, arguing that a shutdown actually hurts the ongoing investigations uh, that are going on into Hunter Biden and, and related matters. And so it's, you know, he's arguing it's in conservatives' interest to keep the government open. But I, I, I don't think that, I, I'm skeptical that argument is going to hold a lot of water with the conservatives. So I think a shutdown certainly above 50 50. Um, I'm probably in the 60 to 65 percent range at this point. Yeah, you know, Brian, we're, we're less than what a month since uh, Fitch came out and, and downgraded the credit rating for the U.S. specifically citing politics. I mean, how much of that does that play into these negotiations and the consideration of what the impact of a shutdown would look like? Yeah, so I, I think it's a talking point for both sides. Um, so those who are arguing against the government shutdown are going to argue the, the, the Fitch downgrade and say, look, you know, we don't we don't have um, we don't have consensus. There's it's, it's government by chaos. And this is this is exactly what Fitch warned us about. At the same time, the conservatives who are arguing, you know, and pushing for a shutdown will say, look, the government's spending too much money. We have to get our house in order. Fitch was absolutely right. Um, so they're both going to point to Fitch, but for different reasons. Brian, do you think history is still a good guide for what could happen here, given the fact that we did have this warning from Fitch and the fact that there's so much, there's such a massive political divide right now between the two sides? Yeah. So uh, when I look back over the last 50 years, there have been numerous shutdowns and I'll, I'll whittle it down because a lot of those shutdowns are over weekends, holidays. And so there's no market impact and there's real no economic impact. So if you get to the six or seven times the government has shut down for five or more trading days, I, I don't think you can get a good correlation to a market move. Matter of fact, the last shutdown we had was one of the longest, if not the longest shutdown we've ever had, 34 days from December of 2018 into uh, January 2019. During those 34 days, the market rose 10 percent. So to get a correlation between a shutdown and the market, I don't think works. So 
I what I'm telling our clients is there's going to be a lot of political noise over the next couple of weeks. But based on history, just stay calm, ignore it, pay attention to the fundamentals, monetary policy, the, the, the stuff that typically drives markets during these shutdowns. It's just not the shutdown itself. So it's a non-event from a market. I, I think so. Yes. I mean, I, I, I think there are other geopolitical and, and government policy related actions that will drive the markets. My advice to our clients has been the shutdown is not one of those. There will be some some economic disruption, but it really delays the economic activity more than anything else, because once the government reopens, Every one, all that activity resumes, and to the extent that payments were delayed, everything is made whole. So it's really just a delay. It doesn't it doesn't change the overall trajectory of the economy? And I think that's why, when you look back over history, uh, the markets have reacted the way they have. Investors are really smart. They really look through the history, the the, the political noise of this, and get to the economic impact. And I think the economic disruption it's short term, it's inconvenient but it reverses itself very quickly and doesn't have a big long lasting impact on the economy. And so investors for the most part, just shrug it off again. You know, we're going to have the fed um, coming out of Jackson hole. We have a September meeting. I would argue that September meeting is going to have more of an impact on the market than a shutdown will. And they're only about two weeks apart. Brian, you said that there was a couple of geopolitical risks here that you're keeping on. So besides the fed, what else do you think is going to be, a bigger driver here than for the market? Well, obviously, you know, in Europe, Ukraine continues to be one of those issues. Um, Secretary, uh, Commerce Secretary Mondo is in China right now. The situation there, um, the, the the situation with the Chinese economy um, is probably bigger. I should have probably put that ahead of, of the Ukraine situation. So I, I would point to those as two that um, two situations that investors are and should be looking uh, looking at more closely. And of course, you know, reiterating what I mentioned before, monetary policy, the Fed meeting, uh, ECB, obviously, Bank of Bank of England, Bank of Japan. Um, there's a lot going on in uh, in the world of, of central banking and fighting inflation. Uh, specifically on uh, Secretary Raimondo's visit, I mean, she made comments over in China saying that she has spoken to American businesses who, who just don't see China as investable. I'm curious what what you're hearing. Uh, how has that view shifted, and and what does that ultimately mean from a DC perspective? I mean, you sort of separate the strategy, the national security importance that the administration is trying to highlight versus what the business case is for the world's second largest economy. So I, I hear similar, um, and I, I guess you can look back. You know, we we had a China policy going back several decades where China was modernizing opening up, becoming more of a market economy. And during that time, national security probably took a backseat to economic growth. Um, China was was seen as a, a, as a potential adversary globally, but the fact that it was opening its economy uh, led a lot of people to believe that eventually political reform would follow. Um, the market reforms halted and reversed. The national security concerns have become greater, putting economic issues to the back burner. I think Ramondo being in China helps to highlight that because I view the Commerce Secretary, the position, not not the individual, but the, but the position as being really an advocate uh, for U.S. business abroad. And I think Secretary Ramondo is taking that message to China. And I think that's a positive. It's always positive to have these discussions. But I think we need to be sober in looking at the situation in China because of under President Xi and the reversal of market reforms, um, really a, um, a a backward move politically uh, in terms of opening up China's uh, Chinese society. Uh, I think national security is a bigger issue. And, and so, yeah, it, it makes China um, less investable than it has been, you know, going back the, the 20, 30 years that many, many businesses were used to. This was a little bit more hesitant, uh, given the current uh, geopolitical landscape. All right, Brian Gardner, great to have you. Steve Folt, Chief Washington Policy Court uh, Strategist.
Thanks for having me. The deadline is fast approaching for Congress to pass a spending bill and avert a government shutdown by the end of this month. We have been down this road before with the Democrats and Republicans unable to come to an agreement on the budget. The key sticking points this time around, well, some Republicans are looking for deeper spending cuts, while certain members of the more conservative wing of the party in the House are asking for tighter border policies and a vote to impeach President Biden. Here with the latest from the Hill, we've got Democratic Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen. Uh, Senator, it's good to talk to you today. I realize so much of this is up in the air on, on, on the House side of things, but how optimistic are you that a government shutdown can be averted? Well, it's good to be with you. And, and the answer to that question really does depend entirely on what's happening in the House of Representatives. And the reason I say that is that here in the Senate, uh, we do have a bipartisan bat, uh, path forward. Uh, there's agreement that we should have a short-term continuing resolution uh, to give us a little more time to put together the final uh, bills, budget bills uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, and we've already passed all of those bills out of the Senate Appropriations uh, Committee almost unanimously. Uh, so the real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country uh, before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way. And Senator, let's talk a little bit about the risk of doing so. We've heard a number of economic projections, but when it comes to spending, there has largely been criticism really from both sides of the aisle, from the amount of spending that has happened down in D.C. over the last several years spanning a number of administrations are you at all hesitant? Are you at all worried the fact that we are going to continue to increase the spending here, given where the deficit is today? Well, I, I think if you look at the bills that have been passed over the last couple of years, uh, you see a significant focus on important investments, including the Inflation Reduction Act and the clean energy industry, uh, the infrastructure bill. So I think those are important investments in the economy. I will say that as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, for example, um, it was in the end deficit neutral uh, because we did um, raise taxes on some of the very wealthiest uh, corporations. We essentially put in place a minimum uh, tax for the, for the most profitable uh, corporations. So um, look, at the end of the day, uh, it was really important to help the economy uh, during COVID. Uh, but, but yes, looking forward, it's going to be important to make sure we keep an eye on the deficits. Uh, Senator, uh, let's switch gears here to talk about a big meeting uh, that you were part of today. We, of course, had uh, major tech executives coming into D.C. to discuss the framework of AI regulation. I'm curious what you think that framework should look like and to what extent these executives, CEOs, should have a say in that, given that they are the ones that are creating or behind this technology? Well, I attended uh, the morning session, which uh, lasted a couple hours. I thought it was a very good discussion. Uh, we had the CEOs of tech companies. We also had the representatives, representatives from the, the labor movement, AFL-CIO, um, and from a number of civil rights organizations. And look, the good news was there was broad agreement uh, that there's an important federal government role to play in establishing um, guidelines, rules of the road, uh, to try to make sure that we have a AI implemented in a, a safe way. Uh, of course, you know, the challenge is always the details and the devil is in the details. But this was a really important step uh, to get a lot of people uh, in the room uh, and begin to sort of sketch out uh, the way forward and, and get broad agreement uh, that we do need to provide some federal guidelines and, importantly, some kind of federal mechanism for testing uh, the AI systems uh, to ensure that, in fact, they are uh, meeting the, the safety requirements, that they do have the boundaries uh, that people agree are necessary. 
Senator, it sounds like you might be, or are you confident that you are going to be able, that lawmakers will be able to get the support here, bipartisan support, to actually pass some meaningful legislation when it comes to AI? Well, I hope so. Uh, as I said, uh, the devil's in the details. Uh, I think you'd find broad agreement even today on some general principles. Uh, the challenge always is in translating general principles uh, into more detailed uh, guidelines. Uh, but I, I do think that, that getting everybody in the room, and I'm not just talking about you know the CEOs and the civil rights groups, I'm also talking about uh, senators from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, uh, to begin to kick around these ideas was an important first step and, and really unprecedented uh, in many ways. I think it is an indication uh, that uh, you know folks recognize that AI can be transformative, uh, can bring, of course, many positive uh, things uh, to our country and, and to the world, but also uh, there are great risks. And so, again, a, a very important first step, uh, but just that, a first step. And Senator, when we talk about tech regulation, you know, we understand that's not a fast process. The, the issue is always the tech moves quicker than the regulation. And lawmakers in D.C., you know, have often been criticized for moving too slowly around tech. You look at things like social media, privacy, security there. What are some of the lessons that you've drawn from that? How do you apply that to AI, just given how quickly, especially generative AI technology is moving right now? Well, I, I think you put your finger on the fundamental issue, which is trying to make sure that um, we move more quickly. Uh, technology moves extremely quickly. And I think there is a general consensus uh, that when it comes came to things like social media, um, that the, the Congress uh, did not move fast enough. In fact, it really hasn't moved. And because we think AI could have, again, these very big risks along with big benefits, uh, that it's important to set these boundaries early. And there was consensus that the federal government is really the only entity uh, that can do that uh, at the scale necessary. And also a sense that it's important for the United States uh, to get its act together so that we are a global leader uh, in terms of setting out these, these guidelines. Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen uh, joining us from DC today. Really appreciate the time. Good to be with you. Thanks. Let's talk more about domestic politics for a moment. The Senate back in session tomorrow, which has about three weeks to pass spending legislation before September 30th. Or if we're talking about it again, the government shut down. Um, Greg, I'll go to you first on this. Do you think there will be a resolution before the deadline? Probably not. I think there are enough hardliners in the House who want to defy uh, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, I think their demands are totally unrealistic. Uh, and I think there's a decent chance there will be a shutdown. I don't think it's a huge negative for the economy if there's a shutdown. I mean, if you want to go to a national park, maybe you can't. But, you know, the, the Fitch Rating Agency this summer talked about how dysfunctional our budget process is, and they'll get more uh, ammunition for that argument probably at the end of this month. Yeah, and, and you sensed it in Julie's voice earlier as well. I mean, in all of us wanting to hit the, I'm tired, I got to go to bed now, on this discussion yeah. every time it comes up. Um, you know, Steve, is there going to be, is there likely to ever be any type of budgeting reform so that we don't always get to this impasse? Well, budgeting reform would mean that legislators who are right at the edge of power you know, the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Chip Roys and others who can, the Matt Gateses who can hold the Speaker of the uh, House essentially hostage to, you know, whatever uh, positioning they've got. If it, when you have a narrow majority, uh, you're not going to reform anything because someone in that equation has a, a lot of power. So my answer is uh, unequivocally no. Um, I agree with Greg's assessment, but the other, you know, fly in the ointment here is that before you get get to this, some of those holdouts and those hardliners are demanding, you know, an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. And so I think I think Kevin McCarthy is going to have an interesting month. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, we also got the news, by the way, that Nancy Pelosi is going to be running again, which was a bit of a surprise. And And to take a step back here, I mean, you look at that sort of entrenched leadership, you could argue, on the Democratic side. You look at this, in, you know, perpetual argument over government shutdowns. 
you know, we talk about the approval rating of the president, but the approval rating of Congress is problematic as well. Greg, does it matter to members of Congress if sort of writ large their approval rating's bad as long as they keep getting voted in? No, I don't think it matters a, a lot, but I, I do think that the, the hardliners are the ones to watch, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, You know, as Steve was saying, the, I mean, there are people who are going to be quite militant on this. Uh, I'd like to think that this can get resolved, but I, I think this drags on one way or another, either through kick the can or a temporary uh, continuing resolution. This thing's going to drag on until the middle of December. Oh, Greg, come on. <laughs> Give me some Sorry. better news here. Oh, we love talking about this I love a realist. Stuff. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. Give it to me straight. Greg Valliere, AGF Investments Chief U.S. Policy Strategist, and Steve Clemens, Semaphore Editor-at-Large. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. The countdown is on to avert another government shutdown with less than 12 days left on the legislative calendar to clear a spending bill. But with House Republicans divided and a split Congress, it's looking more and more likely that we could see a shutdown. Joining us now is Jeanette Lowe, Strategic Securities Policy Research Managing Director. Uh, Jeanette, good to talk to you today. So where do you put the odds of a potential shutdown right now? Hi, well, thanks for having me. So our current odds are very high as well. So 75% chance as of today that we do have a government shutdown on October 1st because the House and the Senate are coming at government spending for the current fiscal year for FY24 at different levels. There's only a couple of weeks before they have to pass the budget by September 30th, and they could pass a continuing budget resolution in order to continue current funding, or we would go into a government shutdown. And one of the problems with having them try to pass a continuing budget resolution, which they have done many times in the past, is that the House conservatives are currently asking for other policy provisions to be attached to it, things like border security that are just not going to pass on a bipartisan basis. And because of the stalemate, we do think it's more likely currently that we will have that shutdown. Jeanette, if we do see a shutdown, what are the economic implications of that? So, you know, we've looked historically at government shutdowns in the past. Um, you know, they've, they've varied in how long they have lasted. But in general, uh, government shutdowns have not had a significant impact on economic growth or on the stock market. So the last six government shutdowns have occurred in quarters with positive economic growth. Usually they do last a little while. The government reopens. That spending that was supposed to be done during those weeks does come back out. So it's had a very modest impact. The one thing that we're watching for with this current shutdown is would Moody, Moody's potentially put the U.S. on a credit ratings watch during the shutdown? down because of it. They've been saying, um, the credit agents have been saying that process is becoming more important with things like the January 6th event, with uh, the debt ceiling fights that we continue to have and the government shutdowns. And that's the potential where we see more risk is if we do actually have that credit watch come into play, that would be a much more significant event for financial markets in our view. Would that have any bearing, though, you think, on negotiations uh, in D.C.? I mean, certainly that doesn't seem to have made an effect when you consider what Moody's did, um, you know, what what the credit down downgrade has meant for, you know, how lawmakers in D.C. have been watching this. I mean, there have been warnings about the political gridlock that's been existing. Right. And it, you're, at your point, it hasn't actually led to much action yet out of Congress. There is a lot of talk on both sides about having to now address this, but it hasn't really moved it forward. The one thing that I do see is that if we go into a government shutdown, you know, they usually, let's say, last about two weeks in this case. Like looking back, it's very similar to what we saw in um, the October 2013 government shutdown. That one lasted 16 days. This one's kind of setting up to be a very similar situation. So if Moody's were to do that, that actually could be a catalyst for the government to at least reopen, because usually shutdowns end as political pressure continues to build on both sides to then reopen the government. And so that's where we could see it really being a catalyst to have some action. Um, and then it's still up to Congress to decide how they actually want to deal with some of the larger fiscal issues that the U.S. is facing. But that is where it could actually play a role in actually helping to reopen the government, even though it's not exactly the best catalyst to have that effect. Jeanette, what's the risk to the Biden administration on one hand? And then on the other hand, when you take a look at Speaker McCarthy and the pressure that he's under, a number of Republicans want him to reach a deal. And then you have the far right saying that they want him to hold that hard line. What's at risk here when you take a look at those two parties? 
Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, so presidents generally in the third year of their uh, presidency, they hit a low in August of that year in their presidential approval ratings. And President Biden has had very uh, low approval ratings hovering around 40, 41 percent. Uh, we actually do think, though, that if there is a government shutdown and it allows President Biden to kind of retake the bully pulpit and stand up every day and say that he wants to have the government open and that Congress is standing in his way, that actually could be a benefit to his approval rating and give him a boost going into the reelection cycle in 2024. On the other side of that, though, you do have some risk here for Speaker McCarthy. Um, there is definitely some House conservatives who are quite disappointed in what he's been able to accomplish as Speaker. Um, if he were to cross and go with the Democrats in order to pass a measure to keep the government open, that would definitely cause people to want to move to remove him as Speaker. Um, we definitely don't see an alternative for the Speakership as of yet, but that is definitely a risk that he faces. So he needs to kind of threaten this quite carefully. Now, he has exceeded expectations in the past, um, but it could be that the government shutdown, one of the main consequences is that it does hurt his ultimate power um, in the House. The deadline is fast approaching for Congress to pass a spending bill and avert a government shutdown by the end of this month. We have been down this road before with the Democrats and Republicans unable to come to an agreement on the budget. The key sticking points this time around well, some Republicans are looking for deeper spending cuts, while certain members of the more conservative wing of the party in the House are asking for tighter border policies and a vote to impeach President Biden. Here with the latest from the Hill, we've got Democratic Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen. Uh, Senator, it's good to talk to you today. I realize so much of this is up in the air on, on, on the House side of things, but how optimistic are you that a government shutdown can be averted? Well, it's good to be with you. And, and the answer to that question really does depend entirely on what's happening in the House of Representatives. And the reason I say that is that here in the Senate, uh, we do have a bipartisan bat, uh, path forward. Uh, there's agreement that we should have a short-term continuing resolution uh, to give us a little more time to put together the final uh, bills, budget bills uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, and we've already passed all of those bills out of the Senate Appropriations uh, Committee almost unanimously. Uh, so the real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country uh, before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way. And Senator, let's talk a little bit about the risk of doing so. We've heard a number of economic projections, but when it comes to spending, there has largely been criticism really from both sides of the aisle, from the amount of spending that has happened down in D.C. over the last several years spanning a number of administrations are you at all hesitant? Are you at all worried the fact that we are going to continue to increase the spending here, given where the deficit is today? Well, I, I think if you look at the bills that have been passed over the last couple of years, uh, you see a significant focus on important investments, including the Inflation Reduction Act and the clean energy industry, uh, the infrastructure bill. So I think those are important investments in the economy. I will say that as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, for example, um, it was in the end deficit neutral uh, because we did um, raise taxes on some of the very wealthiest uh, corporations. We essentially put in place a minimum uh, tax for the for the most profitable uh, corporations. So, um, look, at the end of the day, uh, it was really important to help the economy uh, during COVID, uh, but. But yes, looking forward, it's going to be important to make sure we keep an eye on the deficits. Uh, Senator, uh, let's switch gears here to talk about a big meeting uh, that you were a part of today. We, of course, had uh, major tech executives coming into D.C. to discuss the framework of AI regulation. I'm curious what you think that framework should look like and to what extent these executives, CEOs, should have a say in that, given that 
they are the ones that are creating or behind this technology. Well, I attended uh, the morning session, which uh, lasted a couple hours. I thought it was a very good discussion. Uh, we had the CEOs of tech companies. We also had the representatives, representatives from the, the labor movement, AFL-CIO, um, and from a number of civil rights organizations. And look, the good news was there was broad agreement uh, that there's an important federal government role to play in establishing um, guidelines, rules of the road, uh, to try to make sure that we have a AI implemented in a, a safe way. Uh, of course, you know, the challenge is always the details and the devil is in the details. But this was a really important step uh, to get a lot of people uh, in the room uh, and begin to sort of sketch out uh, the way forward and, and get broad agreement uh, that we do need to provide some federal guidelines and importantly, some kind of federal mechanism for testing uh, the AI systems uh, to ensure that, in fact, they are uh, meeting the, the safety requirements, that they, they do have the boundaries uh, that people agree are necessary. Senator, it sounds like you might be, or are you confident that you are going to be able, that lawmakers will be able to get the support here, bipartisan support, to actually pass some meaningful legislation when it comes to AI? Well, I hope so. Uh, as I said, uh, the devil's in the details. Uh, I think you'd find broad agreement even today on some general principles. Uh, the challenge always is in translating general principles uh, into more detailed uh, guidelines. Uh, but I, I do think that, that getting everybody in the room, and I'm not just talking about you know the CEOs and the civil rights groups, I'm also talking about uh, senators from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, uh, to begin to kick around these ideas was an important first step and, and really unprecedented uh, in many ways. I think it is an indication uh, that uh, you know, folks recognize that AI can be transformative, uh, can bring, of course, many positive uh, things uh, to our country and, and to the world, but also uh, there are great risks. And so, again, a, a very important first step, uh, but just that, a first step. And Senator, when we talk about tech regulation, you know, we understand that's not a fast process. The, the issue is always the tech moves quicker than the regulation. And lawmakers in D.C., you know, have often been criticized for moving too slowly around tech. You look at things like social media, privacy, security there. What are some of the lessons that you've drawn from that? How do you apply that to AI, just given how quickly, especially generative AI technology is moving right now? Well, I, I think you put your finger on the fundamental issue, which is trying to make sure that um, we move more quickly. Uh, technology moves extremely quickly. And I think there is a general consensus uh, that when it comes came to things like social media, um, that the, the Congress had, had did not move fast enough. In fact, it really hasn't moved. And because we think AI could have, again, these very big risks along with big benefits, uh, that it's important to set these boundaries early. And there was consensus that the federal government is really the only entity uh, that can do that uh, at the scale necessary. And also a sense that it's important for the United States uh, to get its act together so that we are a global leader uh, in terms of setting out these, these guidelines. Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen uh, joining us from D.C. today. Really appreciate the time. Good to be with you. Thanks. Well, President Biden is to deliver a major economic address in Maryland today. During the address, the president looks to hit on the impact of federal budget cuts. This coming as a government shutdown continues to hang overhead for the U.S. Here to discuss, we have the White House National Economic Council Deputy Director Bharat Ramamurti. Bharat, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. So uh, I want to first talk about some of these budget cuts that the GOP is proposing and how far away they are from what the White House is looking at. Yeah, if you recall, there was a, a set of uh, agreements that were reached in the context of the debt ceiling earlier this year, where the president and the speaker agreed to a certain level of government funding going forward. What we now see is that essentially the House Republican caucus is walking away from the agreement that was reached earlier this year and proposing levels of funding that are far below what were agreed to. So we think that that is uh, both in, in contravention of the agreement that was reached before, but also uh, if enacted into law, would do real harm to 
uh, programs that middle class families and working families rely upon. So then how much incentive is there then to reach an agreement before a government shutdown, given everything that's transpired, especially with, with lawsuits against former President Trump? Are people really digging their heels in there? Or are we actually going to be able to find an agreement at this point? Well, unfortunately, the House Republicans have a history of pushing for government shutdowns. It's happened multiple times. And uh, when you've had this kind of alignment before with the Democratic president and, and House Republicans, um, you know, the, the, the incentive to, to avoid a shutdown should be clear. It was highly disruptive to the functioning of the government. It jeopardizes things like disaster relief for areas that, that need government support right now. It, it, it jeopardizes support for things like cracking down on fentanyl trafficking. Crack. It, it jeopardizes support for uh, funding for Ukraine, which is in bad, badly in need of that right now. So uh, in, in addition to all of that, it causes disruptions for all the tens of thousands of government employees that live in the in the area and across the country. It, it leads to disruptions to things like national parks that American families rely upon. So uh, there's all sorts of good reason to avoid a government shutdown. The, the president uh, and the Senate, frankly, are all basically in alignment about what's necessary to avoid a shutdown. The issue is that as has happened multiple times in the past, House Republicans uh, are, dry, are, are taking an extremist stance that's jeopardizing the basic functioning of government. And obviously, as the president prepares to speak this afternoon, it comes against this backdrop of still stubbornly high inflation taking back up, mostly fueled by gas prices, which is really something that hits home for a lot of people. How tough of a sell does that make, does that backdrop make it when the president is trying to tout really the, the benefits of Bidenomics here? I think if you take a step back, the, the story on inflation is actually very positive. We've seen uh, an enormous decrease in inflation over the last year. It's been cut by roughly two thirds. Uh, even in yesterday's report, which saw that headline inflation tick back up slightly, the story on core inflation, which is, of course, what the Fed tends to look at, uh, was actually very strong. We've seen that core is running at about 2.4 percent over the last three month period, uh, which is roughly in line of obviously slightly higher than the 2 percent target uh, that the Fed has in mind. So. Uh, overall, I think the story over the last year has been extremely positive. We've seen uh, a rapid decrease in inflation at the same time as we've gained millions of jobs. We've seen uh, wages adjusted for inflation go up over that same period of time. Uh, wages adjusted for inflation are higher than they were pre-pandemic. And of course, at the very highest level, uh, the U.S. Has, has seen the highest economic growth of any of the G7 countries since the pandemic, and at the same time, currently has the lowest level of inflation. So. Uh, obviously, there has been a very stubborn global inflation problem that the U.S. has had to tackle alongside our peers. I think the bottom line is that the U.S. has done a better job of addressing that global problem than any of our competitors. And do you think the American public is really more focused on that, on the on the good that, that the President Biden has done versus the things that hit home for them with the, you know, a three foot, you know, price of gas really, you know, standing out to them? Is is the administration doing a good enough job really selling the economic benefits of the plan at the moment? Well, look, I, I think that the, the American public has been through a lot over the last few years. We've been through a once in a generation, multiple generation pandemic. We've seen uh, global economic disruptions as we've come out of COVID. We've seen Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has disrupted global oil and food markets. It's a lot for people to get through. And I'm completely sympathetic with the fact that people may uh, be struggling to, to view the positives in the economy right now. Our job, number one, is to make sure that we continue to steer the economy in a positive direction as we've done over the last two and a half years. I think the United States is in a much better position than its competitors, thanks to the, uh, the bills and the leadership that the president has shown uh, over the last two and a half years. And I think we will remain optimistic that the American public uh, will absorb some of these benefits over time, especially if inflation continues to recede. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think uh, at the end of the day, I, I think we'll be rewarded for the stewardship of the economy that we've seen over the last two and a half years. And Brad, I did want to ask you, because you mentioned some of the some of the, the other international stories. You have to, of course, talk about the U.S.-China dynamic, especially as the U.S. is really tamping down on some of these U.S. investments the companies are making in some of these some of these technologies that are surrounding national security. How do you think that message should really be conveyed in terms of the fact that these are two economies, two biggest economies in the world that still need each other. I think it's exactly what you've described, which is these are two economies that uh, are going to have to coexist in the world. I think we've seen both with Secretary Raimondo and comments from Secretary Yellen and others, uh, a desire to maintain some ties with China while at the same time making sure that our national interests 
and our national security are protected. And that's what you've seen with the executive orders, making sure that foreign invest that our investment in China is not leading to uh, them getting access to certain types of technology. It's what you've seen with our approach to really um, boosting American manufacturing. And one of the lessons that we took away from the pandemic and frankly of, of the last 20 or 30 years is that there are real benefits to making sure that we make more things here in the United States. That's something that the president believes strongly in. It's going to lead to uh, better national security. It's going to make us less vulnerable to disruptions, to supply chain disruptions going forward. And so the president has made a commitment to making more things in the United States, to manufacturing more, especially when it comes to things like semiconductors and clean energy that are going to be vital to economic growth in the future. So uh, we are focused on making sure that American workers in the American economy are doing well. Uh, and we're going to also make sure that our national security is protected in terms of our relationship with China. But we are not seeking to uh, walk away from our relationship with China, as you noted. Uh, we're going to need each other that we're the two biggest uh, economies in the world. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. National Economic Council Deputy Director Bharat Ramamurti, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's focus on the potential political and legislative impact for U.S. capital markets. Joining us now is Brian Gardner, Stiefel Chief Washington Policy Strategist. Good to have you on the show here. So first off, for, for investors who are looking at this and wondering how worried should they be, you know, eight days away from this October 1st deadline in terms of the number of days that... Um, that Congress has to pass something. How should they be looking at this? Uh, I think they should and will be looking at it as a market non-event. They're going to look past it. Um, look back through history. Um, going back 45, 50 years, there have been numerous shutdowns. If you whittle it down to those number of shutdowns that last five trading days or more, because a lot of those shutdowns are weekends, so markets don't care, but those extended shutdowns. And I don't think you can find that where um, where a shutdown led to a big market sell-off. Um, matter of fact, quite the opposite, because I think investors were looking at other factors. But let's just take, for example, the last shutdown, which was one of the lengthier shutdowns we've ever had, 34 days from December 2018 into December 2019. Over those 34 days, the market went up 10%. So you know, if, if investors are thinking of freaking out, I would just say, careful, take a deep breath. Um, markets in the past have not had this big adverse reaction that some may fear to shutdowns. And I think that, I think this case is going to be similar to that. And Brian, I, I want to bring up something here, because obviously, as you've mentioned there, for, for markets, it's essentially going to be a, no, a nothing burger. But Isaac Boltanski from BTIG, he noted some of the concern that might be that might come with delayed government data that the Fed might actually be closely watching and delayed economic data if we do have a shutdown and we don't have people putting these reports out as t in as timely of a manner. Is that a concern, you think, for the Fed and some of the decision making that affects markets? Sure. So for the Fed, I mean, you know, this would come at, you know, we, we have the meeting, obviously, the FOMC meeting this week uh, that coincides with the UAW uh, strike, which you covered in the last segment, and a potential government shutdown. Um, and with the government shutdown, the potential for a lack of uh, economic data coming out as non-essential services get shelved for uh, temporarily, that could be an excuse for policymakers to pause. Right? the The uncertainty of the fallout from the strike, the uncertainty of any economic impact, and the lack of data for a Fed that's data dependent. If they're not getting data, they may just decide to to pause a little while. And I think that's kind of what the markets have baked in right now anyway. So yeah, it's an inconvenience for policymakers who are looking for economic data. A prolonged shutdown could, uh, could leave them blind a little bit for a couple of weeks. And there are some things that happen sort of on, on the edges of these shutdowns, things like if you're trying to apply for a small business loan, if you're trying to get your, your passport process. But in terms of economic impact versus market impact, we should we should be really be focusing on the economic impact at this stage. Okay, there are a lot of inconveniences and nuisances that come along with a government shutdown. I don't want to I don't want to belittle them. Um, you're going to have government employees who are not going to get paid during the shutdown. That's that's a hardship for them and their families, and so um, that that's a real issue. At the same time, all that back pay. And all the inconveniences that go on during the shutdown, they're all made whole once the government reopens. So it's a very temporary economic event and doesn't lead to long-term 
um, economic impacts. Um, the government employee, the government worker that doesn't get paid for, let's just say, three weeks, that three weeks of non-pay will be made up once the government reopens. So the economic impacts really are are so small. It's, it's um, that's why I think investors look past this as a as a market event and and discount it. So Brian, as they are sort of looking past it, even I mean, you have some some sectors, some defensive sectors that are more dependent on government contracts than others. What are the markets then focusing on if they're not right now focusing on this and they don't think it's going to impact them as much? Where should markets be focused? I think it's the Fed. Um, I, I think it's the UAW strike a little bit, although I think that will take I think a only a prolonged strike there would, would have a market impact. But definitely the Fed. I, 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 and Fed and other geopolitical concerns, you know, the, the China tariff issue has been on the table for quite some time. We may get a resolution from the Biden administration later in the fall on the future of China tariffs. And I, I expect they are going to be extended, at least most of them. But those are the those are the uh, events. Those are the uh, developments that that uh, that investors are looking at. Um, and again, you know, the Fed. Um, we'll see what not only you know the 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 statement this week, but obviously the economic projections that come out and and the chairman's uh, press conference afterwards about the path forward where the Fed is going next. And Brian, if you were to advise, you know, some of these investors at the moment, or perhaps some people who are looking at this government shutdown, and if it's not going to be, if it's going to be a nothing burger, are there particular sectors that they should be looking at at this time, even if it is perhaps it's something temporary? In 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 terms of, um, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood the question, but in terms of of looking forward for what sectors outside of of um, of government related uh, entities. Uh, government impact government impacted uh, sectors um no i i i think generally a, a defensive stance right now um because of the uncertainty of where the fed is um so uh um you know i i think hold tight see what the fed has to say what the long term ramifications are for the fed what what next policy steps are 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 going to be uh, forthcoming over the next couple of months it's that time again. House Republicans have released a bill intended to avoid a government shutdown on October 1st. The deal being tabled is very much viewed as an opening gambit and includes an 8% temporary spending cut for domestic agencies. Now, it isn't likely to be accepted by the Democratic-led Senate, especially as it includes border provisions, which are likely to make the plan dead on arrival. A vote on the bill is planned for this week. Let's get the latest with Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Rick, here we are again. And here we are again, and here we're going to stay, I think, for some period of time. Uh, so everything you, you just described is basically just part of the process. This is no kind of breakthrough. Uh, this doesn't mean that there's any kind of deal in sight to keep the government open. It, it's just one of the hoops that Republicans need to jump through. Uh, so what, what needs to happen is uh, that first we have to see if they can actually pass this in the House, and it's not even clear they can get the Republican votes um, to pass this thing. And then it's going to go to the Senate. It's going to die because of those couple of reasons you mentioned. The de Democrats control the Senate, and they're not going to sign off on 8% cuts in all uh, in spending. Um, so then if it gets that far, then we'll get to the next level and the next level after that. But um, I have not seen any solid political analysis that says uh, there's uh, an opening for a deal here that keeps the government shut down. Uh, it just does seem like we are going to have a government shutdown. And honestly, I don't think uh, ordinary people need to worry about that. Uh, we've been through this before. We know the drill. This is not nearly as dire as the problem we had, uh, the, the man-made problem, I should say, earlier this year when they were talking about defaulting on uh, debt, treasury debt, because they couldn't raise the borrowing limit. So um, this is just going to be a, a tedious and infuriating process uh, that's going to go on for weeks and perhaps a couple of months, I think, before... Uh, we ever get back to something that looks like normal. So everybody, um, find something else to pay attention to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with that in mind, though, obviously we know that the, the blame game will, will always be on the table, especially when we look ahead to an election he year here. What does this, well, how does this position these candidates if they're not able to sort of find an agreement here? And we do have a prolonged perhaps shutdown. I, I mean, the, the broader things to keep in mind here are, first of all, uh, Republicans do control the House of Representatives, but only by four seats. And they've got this hard right faction. Uh, that's the group that's pushing for 
the, the you know the, the fairly severe spending cuts they want strict new immigration measures fully knowing uh that the house may not be able to to uh vote all that stuff in and that the senate for sure is going to kill it so the real question here is how much power uh this group of uh hard right republicans in the house really holds over speaker kevin mccarthy we're we're back to questions about whether he can keep his job through all this and how far they're willing to go to just obstruct the normal functioning of the country. There are some Republicans who uh, believe, and I think believe correctly, that it's just a losing move to shut down the government. I mean, most Americans don't want this to happen, uh, even if they agree with some of the Republican causes. They don't think this is the right way to do it. And we know from past shutdowns, I mean, this mainly is a Republican tactic. Democrats don't really shut down the government. They have other tactics. Um, this has not worked for uh, for Republicans. I mean, polls have shown they do. Uh, people generally do blame Republicans for shutdowns, and they are the ones uh, essentially causing a shutdown this time. So we are back to this situation we've been at before, when it's a relatively small minority of the House that is saying we want to stop the functioning of the government in order to make a point. Um, and Americans in general are kind of like, could you just leave the government functioning and make your point some other way? Indeed. October 1st will be uh, ticking up quickly. And with, you know, not that many days in session left. We'll have to see what happens. Only eight Thanks days, honestly. Speed, eight always. working days in Congress. See? Before and we there you go. Time. To try and to try and cover all those issues. Good grief. A very old Rick Newman. Thank you, as always. See ya. Speaker Kevin McCarthy and House Republicans recently proposed a 30-day stopgap funding bill that would set the current government spending level at $1.48 trillion a year. For more on the possibility of a shutdown and the impacts it could have, let's bring in Senator Jeff Merkley, Democratic Senator of Oregon. Uh, Senator, it's good to talk to you today. I realize the discussions are continuing within the House GOP, but you're on the Hill. What are you hearing about, about progress being made and the prospects of a shutdown as we get closer to that deadline? Well, right now, the odds of a shutdown are increasing. What we're seeing is that uh, Matt uh, Gates has uh, said, hey, let's, uh, let's have a shutdown and then bring up individual spending bills during the, during the shutdown. Well, that, that is a terrible route to go. I think this is, you know, adult, modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep uh, society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple of days ago. And if there is a shutdown, Senator, who, in your opinion, gets the blame for that? Oh, absolutely. Kevin McCarthy and the, the MAGA right. Uh, you have a bipartisan process in the Senate where every single spending bill has come out of committee, uh, most of them unanimously with D's and, and R's. Uh, a lot of support for bipartisan continuing resolution that will be in place while we get those bills passed and reconciled with the House. But over on the House side, uh, they're talking about if they even put forward a proposal, it'll be very short for a month. They're talking about an 8% reduction from the deal that Kevin McCarthy uh, pledged himself to with a handshake three months ago with the president and Senate leadership. There's no way that's flying in the, in, in the Senate. So all of this comes down on Kevin McCarthy and the MAGA right. Uh, Senator, it does feel like we are having this conversation every few years, and you have to wonder if there is a way out of this constant threat of a government shutdown. You have Oklahoma Senator Langford introducing this bill that would essentially uh, automatically provide continued appropriations if spending bills don't get enacted. Is that something that you would support? You know, it's an idea that's been floated for some time. Uh, but it has a downside also, which is then those who want to make sure that there is no increase in government spending to address challenges we're facing can be the ones who obstruct the possibility of passing spending bills. Uh, so I wouldn't leap onto that, onto that bill. I don't think it's a balanced presentation. What I would say uh, is we should have a process on our spending bills whereby if they come out of committee in a bipartisan fashion, substantial bipartisan support, 
they ha are guaranteed to get to the floor with a certain number of germane amendments from each side, and then it would be appropriate to be able to, to have a vote to close debate. It would still take 60 votes, but you could do all that without the extensive time delays that exist in the current rule. We could do appropriation bill a day under that type of, uh, of, of you know, rule adjustments. How realistic is that process, you think, given the current political well, environment? <laughs> I, th I think the, uh, it's really hard to change a, a Senate rule, but if there's enough frustration on the Republican and Democratic side to say, this is the way it used to work. Uh, it was done, however, by social contract. You bring the appropriation bill to the floor, you have a bunch of amendments from both sides, they pertain to that bill, that means they're, they're, they're germane. And then we say, okay, let's get this one done, because you know we've got 12 of these to do. Uh, and uh, if you can't do it by social contract, the way it was done before, setting out uh, a, a set of guidelines that allows you to achieve it is, is logical. I will not say that we're anywhere close to, to, uh, to driving a rule change that would give us something like that, but that's the way to functionally address these continuous shutdowns. And Senator, I want to switch gears here to another topic. You know, you have been very involved in this push to end congressional stock trading. I realize that's that's not an issue that's on the front burner right now. But any any optimism you have about that issue moving forward? Well, I do have some optimism uh, because we have uh, 24 sponsors on a, on the Ethics Act uh, that would end that stock trading. Uh, we have uh, another bill uh, that uh, uh, Senator uh, Gillibrand has done with uh, Josh Hawley that only has two people on it, but at least it's uh, bipartisan. Uh, I do think that there is a possibility of uh, the committee that has control or jurisdiction here. Uh, I've held conversations with the, with the chair. I think he is uh, interested in, in holding a hearing and a markup, and I certainly am encouraging that to happen. It does feel like we've had a number of bills being introduced, but we haven't really reached that finish line. Is there any way to move the needle, you think, on this particular issue, short of passing legislation? Well, short of passing legislation, no. Uh, senators have their complex financial lives. They have their, their trusts and their blind trusts. They have their, their, their spouses who have complicated lives. They own businesses. Uh, and the, within the, without legislation, they're going to say, I'm just going to keep doing what I, what I want to do. Uh, there is some social pressure now from constituents to say, uh, hey, why are you trading stocks? So there may be a little more reluctance in recognizing that this not only creates uh, the opportunity for corruption because you get a lot of special information. Maybe it's not technically inside information. It's always hard to get it. You know, in the, under the law, it's hard to prosecute for inside information. But I hear stuff all the time that makes me think, boy, ah, wouldn't that be a good event? That's why I don't trade individual stocks. And nobody else should uh, either, because it's not just that members of Congress end up having an advantaged position. It also means that the public looks at it and goes uh, quite appropriately. Uh, that's corrupt to have people writing drug laws and simultaneously trading in drug stocks or getting special classified briefings that tell them what might be happening down the road and, and deciding to hedge their risk by trading in advance of everybody else. Uh, those, that's just just wrong. It needs to end. I'm, we are closer than we've been in the past to have a, a quarter of the Congress on a, on a or the a quarter of the Senate on a single bill. That's never happened before. And uh, so uh, I want to keep keep this in the limelight. It may take another scandal to put it across the finish line. Well, Senator, we'll be watching closely and we appreciate your time. That was Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. Great to be with you. Do you still have hope that we will see some sort of deal before next Friday? There's always hope, and uh, I don't believe believe in a no-win scenario. I think we've had a we had a pretty frank discussion and conference uh, a couple days ago about certain what some of our members. Remember, 95, 96 percent, maybe even 98 percent of the conference is united in what we want to do, but we don't have a significant majority. And so, when all the Democrats vote against it. All it takes is four or five uh, Republicans to join the Democrats, and then you know any deal is, is shut down. And unfortunately, we have four or five Republicans that are joining the Democrats and uh, voting no. So um, that's uh, that's what's going on. And uh, you know we our test runs were defense where we had absolutely uh, no no difference of opinion, but 
there is uh, supposedly a level of trust. Uh, some of our more uh, conservative members uh, to the far right, uh, they want to see some uh, appropriations that actually reduce spending before they approve any appropriations that increase spending. We're all in agreement. Defense needs to have more funds, not less funds. But the bulk of it, the rest of it, will have a significant reduction in, uh, from last year's budget as we start to tackle our, our debts, uh, our debt. Uh, you know, we have $33 trillion of debt, uh, which, is, uh, which is a grave danger to, uh, to America in the future. Eventually, pretty soon, we're going to be paying more in debt service than we are to, to defense. And that's uh, that's a line that we don't want to cross. Uh, we're going to cross it, but somehow we got to come back from it. So that's uh, that's what's going on in Congress right now. Representative, does it seem like your colleagues in Congress are fully aware of what the economic impact might be if there is a shutdown and if there is not a deal reached, as we discussed with economists and portfolio managers, what that means for Americans' pockets? You know, is it clear that? the rest of the congressional members are also fully aware of that. Yeah, they are. Uh, absolutely, they are. And so, like I said, you know, we got 90, like, I'm going to say like 98% of our conference is is okay with a deal that was cut about a week ago where we actually get a uh, funding resolution which uh, cuts spending by 8%, uh, also puts a, on it a, a, um, a, a rider which will secure the southern border, which uh, everybody is in favor of securing the southern border, and then um, you know make and, and making our way to to the Senate for their, uh, I guess uh, you know evaluation about what they're going to do, and then finally the president. So the, the problem is that we've got you know like I said four or five Republicans that uh, don't want uh, they don't want to do that. They want to do uh, what's called normal normal order or regular order where. We have 12 appropriations bills. We've passed one. We have 11 to go. They want to see it go through that process. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure we have time to do them all. We do have time to do a good number of them to show good faith. But at the end, I think we're going to have to need this. We're going to need this uh, funding, um, you know, resolution to get to to the Senate to avoid the shutoff. Yeah, we understand what what a shutoff or a shutdown means uh, to the government, to the American people. Uh, I certainly do not want that. Uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that. And um, and so, you know, it's an interesting situation. I hope that uh, during this weekend we can come to some solution and come back and work it through. Uh, look, uh, it says we only have five working days. That's not true. We're going to work it through. I don't think we're going to go home next weekend So uh, until we see this thing through. Congressman, of course, this situation has once again put the spotlight on Speaker McCarthy. Questions about whether or not he is the right person to unite the GOP at a time when the party remains extremely divided. Yes, it's only a small number of lawmakers who are opposing this deal within the House, GOP lawmakers within the House. But still, though, the fractured GOP party, do you think Speaker McCarthy is the right person for this job? Yeah, Speaker McCarthy has the, has the support of the vast, vast majority of us. Uh, frankly, I don't think there's anybody else that could do a better job. There, there are people that are stuck ideologically in a place, uh, and actually in a place where sometimes, well, a lot of times, actually are voting with the Democrats. Uh, and so that, to me, is a little weird. Uh, a little, uh, you know, you're you're ideologically supposed to be a Republican and this really staunch conservative, and yet you find yourself voting with with the party that you say that uh, is leading the country into, you know, uh, into the depths of destruction. So I don't I don't really get it sometimes. I understand that they have their principle, uh, uh, et cetera. But at the end of the day, a government shutdown serves nobody. It saves no money whatsoever. So anybody coming out and telling, you know, the American people, I'm here to save, you know, the government and all that. Uh, or the American people from this runaway government. Well, you're not going to save any money by shutting it down. You're just hurting the very constituents that you claim to be to be representing. And, and so the vast majority of us understand that. And the vast majority of us on the Republican side, the, only the Republicans are looking to cut spending. Only the Republicans are looking to start to reduce the deficit uh, and reducing our debt. It's not the Democrats that are doing that. And so you know, the fact that these, you know, four or five are holding us up is unfortunate. 
Uh, but when you have a slim majority, then four or five, you know, can, you know, basically stop the wheels of the majority. Uh, that's been very, very frustrating to the majority of us uh, in the party. Congressman, there's also been a lot of questions asked just about the group, this group, the far right group, what exactly they could, the influence they could have on the party going forward, how that could potentially reshape the GOP as we look out even beyond 2024. I'm curious, just from your perspective, what do you see as the future of the GOP party? I think the future of the GOP party lies with the 98% of us that are united in, uh, in what we want to do. Uh, the far right doesn't understand that uh, the majority is actually made in the middle. And maybe they do understand that, I, I don't know. Look, it's the majority makers are actually made in New York and California and that and those districts which can go either to the Democrats or to the Republicans. On the Republican districts, any Republican will win. On a Democrat district, any Democrat will win. It's those districts in the middle that, that determine the majority. And in the House of Representatives, the majority is everything. As a matter of fact, the majority is the only thing. Uh, and so if somehow they, you know, they, they feel that you're going to reshape the, uh, the, the, the GOP or the Republican Party, they're mistaken because you can't win where their ideology in those districts in the middle, uh, in states like California and, uh, and New York. You have to have the right uh, Republican candidates that you can agree with 90% of the time. And I think I'd rather have somebody that I can agree with 90% of the time than somebody I agree with 0% of the time. And so we need to get to that realization that we need to protect everybody, all of our seats, because we have such a narrow majority and we must remain in power. We must maintain the majority in 2024 if we actually want the agenda that most of us want for America. What is that agenda, Representative? Because when we think about some of the cuts that have been put forward, it's areas like Social Security, it's areas like Medicare, it's Medicaid, Supplemental oh. Nutrition Assistance Programs. Some of these are, are critical programs in order to make sure that people have access to health care, to make sure that people do have access to food security, an issue that is talked about by your party as well. So what is the actual agenda? We haven't we haven't cut any Social Security. We haven't cut any Medicare. Those those are false statements. Uh, that's so not that's not part that. of the proposal. Absolutely not. No, no, it's not, it's, sir. Okay, the, and that's part of the, the no. There are no cuts to Social Security. There are no cuts to Medicare in the proposal. That Social Security trillion. and Medicare. No, Social Security and Medicare are part of mandatory spending. We're not even looking at that. What this discussion is all about is discretionary spending. So there are no cuts to Social Security. There are no cuts to Medicare. And anybody who says that is actually wrong. So uh, the, the mandatory, the, the discretionary is what we're talking about. The, there are uh, appropriations bills for the discretionary. That's, that's where the cuts are going to be made. But they're going to be made in areas that are non-defense and not, and not homeland security. So that's where we're going. And, uh, and so, yeah, uh, what is the future? That we have to look at the at government spending. That we are we have we have 33 trillion dollars in debt. That soon the debt service on that debt is going to exceed all that we spent on our military, which is a line that we should never cross. We are putting our children and our grandchildren in debt and ourselves in debt to the point that we will not be able to finance the services that we need in the future, uh, and that's putting America at risk. The Republican Party is the only party that is going to be looking to see how we can we can increase productivity um, and at the same time start to reduce the price of government to the point that we eventually balance the budget and we start to reduce that that debt. You know, if you take a trillion dollars, just one trillion dollars and you lay it end on end. Do you know how far that goes? It's a question. Right? So I'll tell you. It's 92 million miles. It's fr it's further than from here to the sun. That's one trillion dollars. We are 33 trillion dollars in debt. So let's say what's a trillion dollars? But a billion is a thousand million. A trillion is a thousand billion. Uh, some people can't even comprehend that note. All right. It's easy to say, but when you actually put it into effect, it's really tough to to uh, to actually visualize what that means. And so. Uh, yeah, we're putting uh, way too much debt on our children and our grandchildren. We're stealing their future. We need to stop it. And, uh, and the Republican Party is the only party that has a plan to do that. Mm -hmm. 
We, of course, have been watching the ballooning debt as well. But Congressman uh, Jimenez, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And of course, we're going to continue to watch this very closely as we get closer and closer to that looming deadline in order to hopefully avert a government shutdown. Congressman, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City, you're watching a Yahoo Finance. And we're watching this looming government shutdown. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy worked through the weekend hoping to secure a deal by the October 1st deadline. While a shutdown isn't expected to have a major impact on markets, it could affect the Fed's November decision. Without action on federal funding by the September 30th deadline, all non-essential activity by federal agencies will be halted. That includes the correction, or collection, processing, and dissemination of government data. Now, a prolonged shutdown could temporarily halt the release of the September jobs, September CPI, and third quarter GDP reports, all info that the data-dependent Fed looks at to determine monetary policy. So, for more on this and really break it down further, joining us now, we've got Courtney Gelman, who is the Strategic Asset Management Portfolio Manager, and E.J. Dion, who is the Brookings Institution, Senior Fellow in Government Studies. Great to have you both here today. Uh, first, as we think about what the significance of this deadline means and whether or not we're able to see some type of conclusion to negotiations in sight, Courtney, I, I wonder from your perspective what the odds are right now that we would see a, a government shutdown. Right. We put the odds at 75 percent. We think it's really difficult to see a scenario where you don't have a government shutdown. There is certainly the potential for a bipartisan deal coming at the last minute when the Senate moves um, its continuing resolution to the House. That potentially couldn't come until Saturday. So our belief is that we will have a government shutdown. The question is more how long that shutdown lasts. Do you agree with that, EJ? And what is your expectation just in terms of the timeline and how long it could take potentially for both sides to reach some sort of agreement? Well, I agree with Courtney that as things stand now, a shutdown seems highly likely. What's very odd about the situation, and some of the interviews you showed earlier indicate that, is that it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, Speaker McCarthy has decided that he does not want to bring a bill to the floor unless he, it's passed with all Republican votes. But he's got about 20 Republicans on the far right of their caucus who want all sorts of things, uh, cuts and policy positions that will never pass the Senate. And he's worried that if he doesn't have an all Republican bill, some of these uh, folks on the right are gonna try to depose him, throw him out as speaker. Um, there are probably 350 votes on that floor to avoid a shutdown. And I use that number uh, because when McCarthy negotiated the compromise with President Biden uh, earlier this year, uh, a majority of Republicans and Democrats voted for it. So the one way out is for McCarthy at some point to decide uh, that a shutdown is worse for him and his party than the threat to him of getting having a motion to vacate the chair, as they call it. I still think that's a possibility because there are um, uh, nearly 20, I think it's 19 Republicans from districts that voted for President Biden who really, really don't want a shutdown. And so that's a long shot. That's why Courtney's odds are right. But I think in the end, there are the votes there if they want to avoid it, at least have a temporary uh, continuing resolution that allows them to negotiate for another month or two. EJ, do you think Speaker, Speaker McCarthy is in a lose-lose situation just in terms of the options that he has out in front of him? One, he could side, he could be viewed as siding with the Democrats and avoid a government shutdown. And then on the other hand, if we do see a shutdown, obviously the blowback from that, but also the fact that he would then be siding with some of the members of the far right from the GOP. Is that, I guess, how is he thinking about those stakes and exactly what's at risk for him personally? You know, it's nice to have a question where the answer is clear. The answer is yes, he is in a lose-lose um, situation, which is why um, this is so difficult. Um, the, he knows that uh, if he passes something with all kinds of provisions to satisfy the far right, that will never get through the Senate, uh, or he may not have the votes at all, thus a shutdown. But if he gets a shutdown, that's very bad for him and his party uh, going forward, this is configured in a way uh, that he and his party will take most of the blame for this. And it's also a historical thing. The shutdown 
has generally been a Republican tactic. Um, so the average voter um, who may not follow all of the ins and outs of what goes on in Congress is more or less inclined to blame Republicans at this point for a shutdown because that's something they've done before. So, yeah, he's in a very difficult position. Um, I think, I mean, I don't think he's going to listen to my advice, but I think in the end he'd be better off to govern uh, and let the chips fall where they may. You might even have a situation where Democrats at some point say, look, if there's a motion to vacate, we'll temporarily back you just so we can govern. And I think the behavior of Democrats in the next uh, several days is going to be really interesting to see what they might do, uh, which would either put McCarthy in a more difficult situation or it might get uh, some resolution that doesn't lead to a shutdown. EJ, I feel like you were all of us earlier in saying that it doesn't have to be this way. And I mean, when I think, Courtney, about the the broader implications here as well, in your notes, you mentioned that this could impact things like the dissemination of data. This could impact the U.S. credit rating. So what type of real ramifications are we looking at here? Right. Well, the, the ramifications certainly aren't as severe as the debt limit, which was when McCarthy did have to make that deal with Biden. So we actually don't think that McCarthy has the cover right yet right now to make the deal with Democrats. You know, when we're one to two weeks into the shutdown and the Republicans are getting more blame, that might give him the cover that he needs within his own party. But in terms of the ramifica ramifications, typically the stock market doesn't react that much. We do have a lot of headwinds, as you all have repeatedly discussed over, over the morning. So we do have a lot of headwinds, and this is exactly Debating those concerns. Certainly, companies levered to you know government and federal funding, those are going to be more impacted than the market overall. Typically, not a huge GDP impact, especially because this is happening at the beginning of a quarter, so there's time to make this up. The Fed won't have access to data, but they will potentially still be able to get the September data because um, that data was collected. It just won't be disseminated. I'm sure that if they ask for it, they can you know, be able to get it. Um, and they will still have private data that's still being collected and being published. And then the credit scenario is something that I would say we're the most concerned about, where if you have Moody's put the U.S. on credit watch over the process of a government shutdown, similar to what we saw in 2011 when the S&P downgraded the U.S. off of the process of the debt limit and earlier this year when uh, Fitch downgraded the U.S. So we are concerned about a credit watch. Um, but we don't necessarily think that Moody's would make the decision to actually downgrade the U.S. debt. We think that they would make that decision later, um, potentially when you have another debt limit fight in 2025. Courtney, why do you think that is? Why don't you think they would be willing to make that decision now? Again, I mean, this is this is less of an issue than the debt limit. Um, you know, this is... A, we, it's much better to have these types of arguments over things like government funding rather than the full faith and credit of the U.S. Um, so we don't think that they would make the decision to actually downgrade the U.S. more that they would put the U.S. on credit watch. That certainly still has you know, ramifications. We could have equity headwinds. There could be further upward pressure on yields. It certainly doesn't help the U.S.'s global standing um, with other countries trying to challenge the U.S. dollar. Uh, but it's not, you know, this the government shutdown is not the same thing as us breaching the debt limit. Courtney Gelman, EJ Dion, we have to leave it there. Of course, we're going to continue to watch this as the clock ticks down to that October 1st deadline. Thanks so much to you both for sharing your perspectives. A government shutdown could force FEMA to stop all disaster aid during the peak of hurricane season. With that in mind, the government agency is already nearly stretched to its limit. FEMA restricted its spending back in August to only address life-threatening emergencies. The restriction means thousands of projects to rebuild facilities and infrastructure after disasters, typically funded in large part by FEMA, have been put on hold. Joining us now is Craig Fugate, former FEMA administrator. I appreciate you joining me this morning. So when you talk about where the funding shortfall already was, what does the threat of a looming government shutdown add in terms of the increased pressure on FEMA's responsibility? Well, the biggest problem for FEMA will be all of the uh, permanent workforce, about 5,000 employees, um, will be put at risk in a, what they call lapse of funding if the government shuts down. So while disaster work can continue because those funds don't end at the end of the fiscal year, but they're running out, all of the permanent workforce uh, they have to go and, and do what we call, you know, each person, each position, what's going to be considered essential and what's got to go, you know, people that will have to go home and stop work. That could be, you know, the 5,000 workforce, that could be, you know, 90% of the folks are at home, uh, not working their jobs and not supporting the disaster response teams. 
And so then when it comes to actually responding to disasters, as we're, we're in the peak of, you know, hurricane season, a lot of extreme weather continuing, what sort of, how do you see that affecting the response that FEMA's, that FEMA's able to give in the, in the event of some of these disasters? Well, I'll give an example. During one of the government short shutdowns during the Obama administration, uh, we had a tropical system form and we had to start calling staff back in the FEMA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And many of these folks had been furloughed. Uh, they were uh, not required to stay there. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get hold of them and have them come in. And they were continuing to do that while not being paid. So then in terms of the most pressing needs then, in order to be able to have FEMA still respond to these disasters, what are the key priorities that need to be funded for FEMA? Well, the big one is the disaster relief fund, and that's the fund that FEMA has already restricted permanent work until they either get a continuing resolution, which will put money back into it, or a separate supplemental. Uh, you know, this is the thing that with the continuing resolution, uh, it would replenish not only FEMA's operational budget, the base budget of the people that are permanent workforce, it would also put money back into the disaster relief fund. And that should allow FEMA to go back to allowing permanent work to go forward. As it is, those funds are still going down. They still are able to respond to immediate needs. And that will not end with a lapse of funding. Those dollars are not a annual appropriation. So they can continue to do that work uh, starting October 1st. But the rest of the FEMA workforce, uh, up to 90% of them potentially could be sent home. And many of those permanent workforce are the people behind the scenes making sure the disaster team and those funds and all the resources they need are, are, are being met. A government shutdown looms with the deadline now less than a week away. President Biden and Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg ramping up calls for Republicans to come to a resolution ahead of Sunday, warning of impacts to military paychecks, airlines and public programs. But how is this going to impact stocks? Now, this would be the first shutdown since 2019, where the S&P 500 gained 13 percent during that 35 day stalemate. For more on this, we want to bring in Kevin Gordon, Charles Schwab, a senior investment strategist. Kevin, it's good to see you. So should we be using history as a guide if, in fact, we do see the government shut down, if they're not able to reach a deal by the end of the week? Are markets just going to shake that off? Um, you know, I think you have to keep in mind sort of the context that we've been in, which is, you know, a pretty weaker, a weakening breadth profile under the surface for the market. So I think, you know, if, as an investor, um, if you're looking at this purely from a market perspective and through that lens, you never want to use the shutdown um, as something that is going to drive the market in one direction or another. And, you know, you're just talking about the most recent one. If you look at that episode late 2018 into early 2019, you know, that was a moment when we were coming off that near bear market low in December 2018, you had some pretty strong momentum carrying you through into 2019. So it was pretty hard to work against that current. And then almost conversely, if you go back to the shutdowns that we had in the 70s, you know, we were mired in a, in a secular bear market for stocks, but also fighting a stagflation issue. So I think the backdrop from an economic and a market perspective matters a lot more than, you know, sort of the short term driver of what the potential shutdown means for the economy from a pothole perspective, not necessarily an entire economic slowdown perspective. All that considered, though, Kevin, when you think about some of the areas of government that would be shut down, are there potential trades, portfolio positions that investors should consider in this type of environment and knowing that uh, there could be still much negotiation that needs to come forward even after a potential shutdown? Well, you know, I think the, the good news in this environment, and Brad, you and I have talked about this before, where you never want to be looking, at, especially from a sector perspective, you don't want to be thinking, you know, monolithically or traditionally in terms of what works defensively in an environment when things are slowing down or you're getting a weaker profile from the market. And, you know, case in point is since the peak at the end of July, for at least for the S&P 500, um, the only outperformer and the defensive area of the market has been energy. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, synonymous with what's going on with oil, but also the fact that energy scores pretty well from an interest coverage ratio perspective, meaning, you know, a lot of those companies have the money and have the funds available to pay off interest expense. That's not the case for the rest of the market, certainly not the case for some of the consumer staples areas, which you would typically consider defensive. So even under the defensive or traditional defensive sector umbrella, utilities look very different from staples. They're trading in different ways. Utilities doing a little bit better um, you know, now outperforming energy, but doing a little bit better than what would tr traditionally be considered safe from a staples perspective. 
So, Kevin, taking all that into account, then I guess when investors are trying to figure out when they should be more comfortable adding some of that risk back into their portfolio, what are some of the signs or some of the things that they need to be watching for? Well, I think improving breadth under the surface, because you're now at a point where um, a lot of what had started to look better from our perspective, June until July, somewhat into August, where participation was broadening out. You had seen it a little bit down the cap spectrum. You had seen it um, kind of equal weight versus you know cap weight S&P, but that started to unwind from August into September. And now, um, you know, the unfortunate part is whether you're looking at the percent of stocks above their 50 day moving average or above their 200 day moving average within the S&P, the NASDAQ or the Russell, all of those breadth statistics have started to break down. So it hasn't been the case which is what we were looking for, where some of the air is coming out of the mega cap names, you know, the leaders and the high flyer, flyers that were driving the market's gains this year. Um, it hasn't been the case where that air is going back into the rest of the market. It's kind of been this you know, broader scale breakdown uh, from, from a breadth point of view. So I think that if you get a stabilization there and you start to see the rest of the market do a little bit of heavy lifting, you get that lift from earnings and forward earnings expectations. And I would add, you get a lift from revenue expectations because that's kind of what was missing in the most recent earnings season. That, you know, those are sort of the ingredients that you need, I think, to, to kind of move out on the risk spectrum a little bit. But I think for now, you know, given the unique nature of this cycle, given the kind of non-confirmations along the way, you know, almost a year after a major market low, you're not seeing signs you would typically see in a strong or a durable bull market. You really just want to stay defensive in factor or characteristic terms, not necessarily like I was saying from a sector perspective, but moving up in quality, staying high in that quality you know, area, whether it's large cap versus small cap, whether it's high interest coverage versus low interest coverage, things of that nature. Kevin, even as I'm looking at the futures this morning here, and, and we're seeing some fractional declines across the U.S. major averages, it comes off of last week where some chop was reinitiated, and that really driven by the Fed's commentary and the markets really digesting what a more hawkish Fed might continue to mean in terms of their own rate, rate policy going forward from here. What type of overhang do you believe that that's going to be in Q4 as we kind of are basically in the last week and closing the books on Q3 now? Well, I think even beyond Q4, um, what you have to now keep in mind, and most recently Austin Goolsby was out this morning talking about this, is it's it's not the higher for longer, you know, the higher part of that. It's now the for longer. Um, and, you know, Jay Powell was kind of alluding to this where we now need to start considering whether they hike again or not in November. I'm not sure that's as much the focus as it is moving into next year and how long they stay at a restrictive level. You know, whether the right rate cuts that the, that the market's pricing in right now are correct in the sense that they're just going to be a little incremental and the Fed still keeps real rates elevated. Or if we do have to turn around or if the Fed does have to turn around, start to pivot aggressively and cut rates. But that would be, you know, kind of for the wrong reasons economically. But I think, you know, the overarching theme of all of this is, as you mentioned, you have to start thinking about what are the knock on effects from what they've already done? And then what do we start to see as they keep rates restrictive? Because you're just getting to that restrictive level now, as the Fed believes. And you still need to see key parts of inflation that they're tracking roll over. Um, you know, you could look at just core goods versus core services inflation. And, you know, most of the disinflation progress so far has been in the former. And that's the supply chain unwind. That's kind of the pandemic unwind from all the stress that we had in the bottleneck. Um, so as that's kind of been alleviated, now you have to shift your attention to services and then any connection that that has with the labor market. So, you know, any tightness you see in labor, any you know potential unwind there, yeah, that probably alleviates some of the inflation pressure, but is the expense, um, you know, sort of on the economic side where you start to see spending slow down and then that tips you into more of a slowdown or a recessionary environment. Too soon to tell what the, you know, what that's going to look like. But I think you have to keep that dynamic in mind, especially now that we're getting closer to the end of the tightening cycle than we are at the beginning. Yeah, and Kevin, given that, I'm curious, what's your base case just in terms of what we're going to see from Fed policy and then the odds or the possibility of a recession? Are you still confident that we are going to be able to avoid a recession and go back to more of that soft landing scenario? Well, you know, one of our, our thesis has been for the past year and a half that the economy has been suffering from some form of recession. Uh, it's just been rolling in nature where it started on the goods and the manufacturing side. Um, in housing, particular last year, housing definitely went through its own recession. Some parts of the housing market are still in recession, but some of those indicators have started to turn up a little bit, whether it's home builder sentiment, although we've had a little bit of a rollover in the past couple of months, um, but you haven't had any recessionary like readings within the services part of the economy or within the labor market. So you've had that nice offset of strength 
in services and labor where you've had you know significant weakness and deterioration within manufacturing and goods so if you can continue to see the roll through of the recession where you start to get some rolling recoveries in manufacturing and in goods but then you start to see a little bit of a slowdown in services and labor you know that in our mind that's best case scenario but if you do start to see some of these rolling recoveries stunted a bit and then you also get no, you know, you don't have an offset anymore from services or labor, then that probably puts the economy into what is more, you know, considered more of a traditional recession. So again, you know, probably the most unique cycle we've ever seen, that makes it kind of tougher to call. But the, the biggest piece to all of this is labor, because if you slow that down enough, you sort of cut the spending power that consumers have had now that you have this kind of savings cushion um, that has, you know, wound down pretty much, not to nothing, but, you know, getting closer to that point. Um, that's probably the most important dynamic to consider right now, especially as it pertains to Fed policy, too. Kevin Gordon, Charles Schwab, senior investment strategist. Kevin, always a pleasure to get your insights here. Thanks for kicking Thanks, off guys. the week with us. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance, live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. A possible U.S. government shutdown looms, and with it, risks to the U.S. credit rating. Moody's apparently looking at a downgrade if the government does go into shutdown. Our next guest says that that move very much depends on whether there is a shutdown and how long it lasts. If so, joining us now, uh, we've got us uh, a good one, John Heltman, American Bankers Washington Bureau Chief. Always a good one, John, of course. Thanks, um, you're a good one think too. About, <laughs> yeah, thank you, appreciate it. When you think about the, the extent to which, or the time span to which, a shutdown would have to last for it to have a larger impact on the credit rating, as as we had been hearing from Moody's. What type of evaluation would you give that? Or what type of time span will we need to be looking at as well? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, the fact that Moody's is out there already just kind of warning that this is a problem indicates that it wouldn't necessarily have to be a record-breaking shutdown for it to have a negative impact on the U.S. credit rating. Now, this is not a brand new concept, right? I mean, just a few months ago, we had the uh, the debt ceiling fight that was a much bigger and much more kind of existential threat to the U.S. credit availability or credit uh, rating. Um, but I think there's this is part of a broader problem, which is that Congress doesn't really hasn't passed a budget in regular order for years and years and years. And these this just kind of is a perennial problem that keeps happening, keeps coming up keeps coming back. So one of these days, we're going to have to get this right. And if we ever want to have not have this problem looming over our shoulders all the time. John, how closely should investors really be tracking this? Because like you said, largely in the past, when it comes to government shutdowns, we haven't really seen a massive ripple effect in the market that tends to stick. Looking back to 2019, we actually saw the S&P rise over 10 percent during the shutdown. So do you think investors are going to be able to look past it this time around again? I think that markets have generally uh, sort of come to the assumption that there's going to be a shutdown or at least are pricing it in uh, as of right now. So I think the market effects really depend on how long the shutdown lasts. If it lasts, as you say, for like a week or two, I think there's a, a sort of stopgap uh, short term spending bill that's being discussed in the Senate. Uh, that'll certainly buy some time to come up with a more fulsome approach. And if all those things happen, then the effects, I think, on the, on the market are going to be relatively limited. Um, but the real risk is, and the real question is if this goes on for, you know, again, weeks, months, you know, like then, then you really see the wheels come off the bus. Well, another developing story, a bank at Capital Rules and J.P. Morgan's CEO, Jamie Dimon, criticizing the stricter proposals from U.S. regulators, calling the move, quote, hugely disappointing and a risk for U.S. growth. Now, he's not alone. U.S. bank groups also have accused regulators of violating federal laws with their sweeping proposals. We still have John Heltzman, American Bankers Washington Bureau Chief, with us. So, John, when we try to figure out what the implications are for the banking sector, what exactly this could look like, What's on your radar? Yeah, I mean, the, the capital proposals primarily focus on the largest banks. And that by largest, I mean banks with 100 billion of assets or more. That seems like an awful lot of money. Uh, but keep in mind that there's 4,500 depository, or sorry, 4,500 banks, another 4,500 credit unions in the country. The vast majority of those are way below that threshold. So we're really talking about, you know, 20, 25 banks uh, and credit unions or really banks, because this is not a credit union thing yet, uh, that for whom this would apply. But those are the banks that have the vast majority of deposit shares. So it, it's very important. 
And what this would do is it would basically require them to withhold, uh, to hold a great deal more capital than they have been uh, up till now. Uh, that just makes the cost of everything more expensive. It makes uh, it makes them uh, makes it harder to make loans. Uh, makes it more expensive to make loans. Therefore, making them making banks not do it as much. So that's the risk, and and uh, I think that it's decently well founded because we already have some economic headwinds with high interest rates making loan demand, uh, tamping down loan demand, and making it harder for banks to make loans. And so would that lead to further consolidation among banks who can't meet that threshold? Probably. Um, you know, the, uh, if, you, if you have a higher cost to do the same kind of business that you were already doing, uh, eventually banks are going to look around and say, you know what, we could do this better if we merge with these guys or we acquire this or that bank. And especially smaller banks will see that they are having to compete with bigger, well-heeled, better-heeled uh, competitors. So there gonna, there's going to be a lot more pressure to merge. Now, at the same time that all this is happening, the uh, the government, the regulators are considering uh, overhauling the bank merger review process with kind of seemingly an eye towards discouraging mergers. That That is not yet kind of firmly proposed, so we don't quite know what the contours of that are going to be. But with all these things kind of happening at the same time, uh, something's going to have to give. All right, John Heltman, American Bankers, Washington Bureau Chief. Thanks so much for joining us here Thank this you. morning. The government shutdown would have dramatic implications for the U.S. travel economy, with some estimates putting the hit at around $140 million a day. The aviation sector is a key focus. While many essential staff, like air traffic controllers, are expected to report for duty without pay, workers calling in sick could be an issue yet again. We want to bring in Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. And Mike, lay this out for us, because the estimates are all over the place at exactly what a government shutdown, the impact that that is going to have on the travel industry. What's your view? Well, I think initially air travel will be just as inconvenient as ever. Uh, we have understaffed air traffic control systems right now, and the employees know they're going to get paid eventually. The real issue is long term, and it's not just things like training. Buttigieg brought that up. That really won't come into play. What really will come into play is the day to day regulation that the FAA has over airports airlines and also aircraft manufacturers where Boeing won't be able to get that inspector to take a look at that that new system they want approved uh, airport in eastern Wyoming won't be able to get an FAA inspector to come and look at the new runway over a period of time that could have a hit would this also impact some infrastructure projects especially given the environmental reviews permitting that would be disrupted and, and some of these infrastructural projects taking place in or around or at airports it, it, it would, in the near term, it certainly wouldn't have much of an effect. It's only going to be several days, probably. But nevertheless, uh, in, in terms of hurting the environment, that's not going to be the case, I don't think, per se. It'll just, you know, if you shut down the whole air transportation system, that's a lot less jet fuel going into the air. But nevertheless, the bottom line of the whole thing is the FAA is in a situation right now where it needs to get reorganized and revisited. We've got new electric airplanes coming along the line that are really heading for a brick wall regula regulation-wise. We really can't take these people off of those jobs because as they're critically important. You and I don't see that, but in five years, five years, in five weeks, five months, we probably will. Mike, what about the traveler's behavior? Do we typically see people maybe canceling their trips if we see a government shutdown? I think people that don't really look into it probably would assume, yes, if the government shuts down, my airplane might shut down. Let's not go see grandma right now. Um, that there'll be some of that, but I think overall, the at least if this doesn't last, you know, more than a couple of weeks, more than a week or so, we're not going to see a whole lot of anything. I don't see a walkout. I don't see people calling in sick. These controllers and TSA people, they know they're going to get paid. It's just going to be a little late paycheck, and there might be something after it when it comes. Certainly, and and that was the case back in 2019, where we did see absenteeism on the rise, especially after that two-week period because of delayed paychecks. Now, what kind of impact would that mean for the airline operators? Should we get to that point? Well, right now today, our air traffic control system has been a wonderfully bipartisan, you know, mismanaged thing over the last 20 years. So I don't think we're going to see anything missing right now. But overall, you know, it's just going to accelerate a decline in the efficiency of our air transportation system, mainly because of you know the ATC system, but also issues of 
oversight of airlines, oversight of, of airports, oversight of manufacturers and components, that could, that's where the real sand might get into the works. And so, as you were mentioning earlier, it also impacts the, the safety checks therein. So wh what type of resumption would we be talking about thereafter? Well, I, I don't think we'll see anything with safety. If, look, the airline industry today, they know bad safety is really expensive. So you're not going to have that problem. But getting back on, like, we bring up a real good point. When you shut something down, getting it back, getting that in, that FAA inspector back to take a look at that new system that a component manufacturer is putting together might take weeks. So it'll delay a lot of things and, and will hurt some companies. There's no question about it because they won't be able to produce the pro, the, the systems they want to produce or, or de develop them, that sort of thing. It could be, again, that's where you got these billions of dollars and millions of dollars a hit. It's not people getting on the airplane at gate seven at LaGuardia. All right, Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. Mike, always a pleasure to get some of your insights and analysis around this. We'll hope that we don't get to that point, but uh, you may be getting another call from us. <laughs> Love to, thank you, sir. Well, Yahoo Finance's Brad Smith, Shauna Smith, and Rick Newman spoke to former vice president and current Republican presidential nominee Mike Pence this morning. Here's what he had to say about the looming government shutdown. First, let me say about the government shutdown. You know, I was, I was a House conservative leader for 12 years, and uh, House Republicans are the last line of defense for taxpayers in Washington, D.C. So I, I encourage the team there and Speaker McCarthy to continue to drive and drive hard for one more down payment on fiscal responsibility and, and putting our nation back on a path toward a balanced budget. Joining us now is Steve Schmidt, political strategist and founder of The Warning Newsletter, YouTube channel and podcast. Uh, Steve, I'm going to put your have you put your strategist hat on here. You heard the former vice president say, look, House Republicans are the last line of defense to put on a down payment for the future. But he didn't have to deal with such a tight majority within the House specifically. How do you think Kevin McCarthy gets out of this bind? I think that the most important thing to recognize is the degree in Mike Pence's statement is, is how much gaslighting is involved in that. Mike Pence was the vice president of the most profligate, biggest spending administration in American history that added more debt more quickly to America's total debt uh, than any other administration ever. Uh, Kevin McCarthy is not a victim here. John Kennedy had an admonition in his, in his inaugural, and it was this. He said, to the foolish men who seek power by trying to ride the back of the tiger, be careful because you wind up inside the tiger. And that's what's happened to Kevin McCarthy. This is an act of national vandalism, an act of arson that will impose real hardship on the American people. This is not something that is coming from a mainstream. It's coming from extremists, including from Paul Gosar, that threatened to execute the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff yesterday. So this is part of the ongoing, unfolding story of an extremist movement in America that's assaulting the American government over and over and over again. That's what we're seeing. So then, Steve, if you're a Republican presidential candidate, you're looking at this situation and wondering how to position yourself. I mean, we heard former Vice President Mike Pence putting a lot of the blame for even the situation with inflation on he, he wanted to end the dual mandate by the Fed. He would said he would get rid of a foul and really instead focus on protecting the integrity of the dollar. If you're trying to advise a Republican candidate here, how would you advise them? I would tell most of them to drop out of the race, particularly Mike Pence, since he's at 2% in the polls and he has 100% name identification. When the first Republican debate took place, there was a question asked, and eight of these candidates raised their hand. And the question was, if Donald Trump is the nominee, will you support him again? Fully aware of the insurrection, the 92 criminal counts, none of these people are particularly credible as candidates. It's clear that the one who has momentum in the race is Nikki Haley. The rest have little chance. And the truth of the matter is none of them have any influence whatsoever on what's going on in the House of Representatives. 
The clock is ticking for Congress to reach a deal before it's set to run out of money. And with just three days until the deadline, pressure is mounting on House Speaker Kevin McCarthy after the Senate voted to advance a bipartisan stopgap bill in a bid to avert a shutdown. Now, the legislation would extend funding to 2023 levels through mid-November and also provide billions for Ukraine and disaster relief. Here to tell us more, we want to bring in Maya McGinnis, president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Maya, it's good to see you here. So let's start just where things stand right now down in D.C. We had this stopgap bill here from the Senate. Of course, the pressure mounting on House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Is there any way you think that we're going to be able to avoid a government shutdown? Well, I do think it's possible, but I'm probably the most optimistic person uh, there is when it's putting odds on this. In fact, we have the very, very, very unscientific poll of budget experts and they think the chances of a shutdown are about 88%. So pretty much uh, a sure thing. I am more optimistic than that. And I actually thought last night was good news that the speaker was able to move forward on some of these things. There seemed to be a little bit of give, but the bottom line is the clock is ticking. There is very little time to get this done. And the variety of parties, it's not just two parties who are thinking about this, but the variety of groups of interests are very far apart in terms of how much they're willing to give. So it is more likely we will have a shutdown uh, than not, though, again, I, I think we could find a way to eke our way out of this. But even if we don't have a shutdown now, the question is, how will we resolve the big outstanding issues of how you fund the government? There are very different senses of what level the government should be funded at. And if we get a bridge of a couple weeks or a couple months, those outstanding tensions will still remain. So we might be revisiting this again, this again in the future, even if we avoid it now. What continue to be the largest gaps or the largest disagreements from your evaluation? Right. So remember around the debt ceiling where we were talking about an even worse outcome, which would have been defaulting if we couldn't resolve the issue. There was a bill called the Fiscal Responsibility Act that was passed. In that bill, they set discretionary spending levels for the coming two fiscal years. The problem we have right now, and we know what those numbers are, we know what the level should be set at, it was complicated by that there were a number of side deals that actually made those numbers larger than they appeared to be. And so the problem we have right now is that the House is saying, wait, that's higher than we wanted, and I shouldn't say the whole House, a small group of more conservative Republicans are saying that's significantly higher than we want, and we look at those as caps, but we want to come in below them. Lesser understood is that the Senate that has been working to pass their appropriations bills has also said, actually, we don't like these caps. We're going to spend more than is, than is in them. So they've actually broken through them and are putting about $14 billion more into their bills than has been approved. So the Senate wants to spend more. The House wants to spend a lot less. The only way to really go forward is for them to honor the deal and spend at the actual spending level caps. Uh, and then for them to work out the differences because this is going to happen again for the next fiscal year too. They need to be more committed to the agreement they've already made. And then they need to get to the real problem of this, which is the Fiscal Responsibility Act put in place savings of one to $2 trillion, but that's not enough to address the big fiscal problems the country faces. And so as soon as they can get through this, you know, nightmare of a soap opera, they need to turn to the real issue, which is how you deal with our fiscal un fiscally unsustainable situation. What might help us get through that? And Maya, you pointed out there, obviously, the very importance between a government shutdown and a government default. But when it talks about when we focus on the uncertainty that a government shutdown could bring or maybe some of the ripple effects that investors, that Wall Street, that Main Street needs to be aware of, how serious are the potential implications of the government shutdown? Yeah, that's been the story of the past couple of weeks where people are saying, you know, how would this affect real people? What happens? And in some ways, I find that it's, it's unsatisfying because it's not nearly as dramatic as people expect mm -hmm. because most of the government's funded not through these appropriations, but through mandatory spending. Almost three quarters of the budget is kind of automatic and will get paid. And of this discretionary spending, much of it is discretionary declared to be essential, which means things still go on. So the Department of Defense will be operating most of it, most of those parts, the things that you think of as defense policy will be. Many of the other things will be. The biggest example is always, and this stinks if you're going to a national park, but national parks may well shut down. But that doesn't have broad, band, broad effects throughout the economy. However, if this the shutdown lasts, 
it does start to have ripple effects. I was meeting with a group from Arizona yesterday and they said, you better believe that affects our economy. Same with Utah. So it starts to creep into the rest of the economy, not directly, but indirectly. However, most of the estimates of the loss to the economy of shutdowns show that it takes a hit in the first quarter. You make up much of that in the second quarter. I think the biggest problem with shutdown, we advertise to our rivals around the world that we are unable to govern ourselves. And that shows a huge weakness on the global stage, which we should not uh, we, we should not be having and we should not be showing at a time when there's so many frictions around the world. All right, Maya McGinnis, president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Thanks so much for joining us and helping us break down what's in the mix here, what's in the negotiations, and, and we will see if we're able to avoid it. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks. With just days to go before the government runs out of funding, the Senate has unveiled a plan to avert a shutdown. But the bill faces long odds in the House. As Speaker Kevin McCarthy struggles to negotiate a deal that will satisfy hardliners in his own party, his other option is to work with House Democrats. But doing so could position at uh, Speaker in jeopardy. Hard right members, namely Congressman Matt Gates, have re repeatedly and previously threatened to oust McCarthy. Is there any hope to avoid a shutdown this late in the game? And how real is the threat to McCarthy's leadership? With us now, we've got Chris Lehman, who is the nation's D.C. bureau chief. Chris, good to have you here. We've been trying to get a gauge on the probability that we will either go into a shutdown or perhaps on the Roser side, avoid a shutdown. What are you putting those odds at right now? Uh, I would put the odds of a shutdown happening as extremely likely at this point. Um, you know, the deal that the Senate hammered out yesterday um, would be a good framework if we had a, a kind of sanely run um, GOP majority in the House. We don't. Um, as the clips you, you had showed uh, demonstrated, uh, this hard right faction within the caucus is kind of throttling any um, deal out of the gate. Um, they have, you know, um, not even allowed basic spending priorities to come to a committee vote, let alone to a floor vote. Um, as you also noted, uh, the prospect of collaborating with uh, Democrats who could easily pass any House budget measure um, is sort of a poison pill for Kevin McCarthy's speakership. And the reason for that is in order to get the speakership, he um, agreed to a motion to vacate provision, which is what Matt Gates keeps waving in his face every time there's a prospect of any kind of agreement. Um, you know, so you have this kind of nihilistic wing of the Republican caucus that is simply opposed to any agreement that can be depicted as a win for Democrats. And they're prepared, evidently, to shut down the entire government um, to prevent that from happening. Um, and meanwhile, Kevin McCarthy is um, sort of being held hostage to the Faustian bargain he made in order to become speaker. He gave all this power to the hard right in his caucus, and now they are, are flexing it and uh, threatening his speakership. So M McCarthy's ultimate calculation here is do you govern in a responsible manner and keep um you know the basic services of government um functioning and potentially surrender your speakership or do you hang on your to your speakership and own what would by any measure be sort of a catastrophic self-inflicted uh budget crisis uh on the rest of the country um yeah. sadly I everything is trending in, in the latter direction. And Chris, that leads me to ask you, because certainly there have been both sides of the aisle obviously at risk here. If we do see a shutdown, just in terms of public perception and the potential backlash there, if we do see a government shutdown, does anyone win in that situation? No, and, and Mitch McConnell, of all people, has come forward and, and said that nobody mm -hmm. wins a shutdown. Um, and in this case, you know, it is worth stressing, you know, in, in past shutdown fights. Um, there has been engagement on both sides of the partisan aisle. This is a unique set of circumstances in that it's all self-inflicted on the Republican side. Um, you know, Democrats have, you know, not really engaged because they're just waiting for McCarthy to get his caucus in, in sufficient order so that, you know, again, basic committee votes can be cleared. Um, 
So, you know, it's, it's hard to see any scenario. I mean, McCarthy right now is making kind of a last ditch pitch to make it all about border security and claiming that, you know, because, uh, you know, Biden and the Democrats won't endorse a, a draconian border crackdown that they own the shutdown. I don't see that really working um, as as a an appeal to the general public. You're going to see, you know, millions of government workers who are deemed non-essential no longer draw on a paycheck. You're going to see, you know, um, profound, um, you know, knock on effects in the broader economy um, in the event of a shutdown. And again, it all stems from the basic inability um, of McCarthy to keep his caucus in line. That is very much a Republican problem. Should should there be a law preventing a shutdown and, and should we expect <laughs> yeah. any type of reform on that front? <laughs> yeah, that is a, a very good question. Uh, obviously, it seems um, like there should be, but of course, the body to pass such a law would be Congress. And, and we're seeing that, <laughs> you know, Congress is um, not let's just say at its orderly best right now and does you know the other issue here is this hard right faction um you know they come overwhelmingly from deep red districts where they don't suffer a sort of accountability for um you know what are nihilistic actions to s prevent the government from functioning because they just don't like government um and they also aren't really incentivized to govern. They're incentivized by, you know, social media clicks and, and virality and, you know, getting incendiary speeches um, repurposed through the, the social media ecosystem. None of that is the, the business of the people. Um, and it's a perverse incentive, but it's pretty much locked in for this hardcore group of, of hard right representatives. Yeah, and Chris, is is this an issue that we're going to see remain here when we talk about the far right, the division within the GOP party? Is that something that's likely to stay now for at least the foreseeable future, given the fact that we have seen efforts in the Senate and in the House to try and unite the party overall, yet it hasn't worked? Yeah, and again, it's important to roll the tape back to last January when um, McCarthy went through that marathon, you know, 15 vote process to get the speakership. He gave away key um, committee um, chairmanships and rules concessions, including this motion to vacate uh, provision uh, to this hard right. He empowered uh, this faction, which is indeed, you know, not a significant numerical faction, but because of the narrow House majority that McCarthy has, they have the ability to make or break any given bill. So, yeah, it's going to be. Um, you know, this is just one painful and, you know, high stakes illustration of what is a Republican Party um, that no longer really functions as a political party. I interviewed Norm Ornstein, who is one of the most preeminent scholars in Congress, and he said the Republican Party is now a cult um, and it's not governable. And we're seeing that kind of analysis play out in real time over this budget crisis. No, certainly. All right. Well, Chris Lehman, we've got to leave it there. The nation's D.C. Bureau Chief, thanks so much for making the time. Thank you for having me. Take care. The government's risk of shutting down if lawmakers fail to reach a spending deal before the deadline. And if we do, in fact, see a shutdown, small businesses could be at risk. There's a recent survey out from Goldman Sachs that found that 70 percent of small business owners warned that businesses, their businesses would be negatively impacted with revenue, a top concern. Here to talk about that and more, we want to bring in Isabella Casillas Guzman, Administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Administrator Guzman, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. So when we talk about the threat of a government shutdown, what exactly that is going to mean for small businesses, give us a better sense of that risk. Yeah, well, Republican shutdown is definitely going to have serious consequences for our economy, and, and it will hurt small businesses. You know, for example, at the SBA, it'll halt all of our SBA-guaranteed small business loans. You know, we put out the, about $40 billion a year to help support small businesses with affordable capital. 
And in an environment with uh, there's tight credit and higher interest rates, uh, SBA-backed loans are, are highly critical today. And each day of the shutdown, there'll be hundreds of loans that would be stuck, unable to move forward. That might mean a small business has to go to a high interest bridge loan and pay uh, you know, fees that are exorbitant for their business to manage. And they might lose a deal or lose an ability to uh, you know, buy some equipment or buy property. And, and that's what's going to hurt businesses and the uncertainty of it all as well. Administrator, what type of small business funding ha have you also been trying to put forward as part of the budgeting process? Well, we've obviously tried to continue to you know, build up all of our great programs. We help small businesses grow their revenues uh, as well as uh, provide that affordable capital you know, through investments and, and small business loans. Uh, and in particular, when we talk about revenue growth opportunities, this is a historic time when we're investing in America. There are contracts to win around the country. I mean, one of the things that would also be halted in the, in the Republican shutdown would be the processing of certifications to do government contracting for our veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran small businesses and, and women and others. And that limits competition in the federal marketplace and really you know, prevents businesses from moving forward with their revenue growth strategies. And we need all of our small businesses to be successful. We have an incredible footprint on the ground, a uh, network of over 1,600 centers. You know, while each of those are, are independent nonprofits that we provide grants to, we can't provide oversight and customer service for them to continue their good work. So we, we know that the, there's going to be devastating impact. And we continue, of course, to put forward in the president's budget uh, a plan that will uh, continue to grow our great uh, capital programs as well as our networks and support to small businesses. Administrator, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, just in terms of the general sense of sentiment right now of small business owners, given the fact that this is just, when we talk about the government shutdown, this is just the latest in a long list of uncertainties that many of these small business owners have been facing now for quite some time. That's right. I mean, uncertainty is what any small business owner will tell you is disruptive. You can't plan around that. And they're problem solvers uh, themselves. You know, they have a lot of grit and determination to be resilient, uh, but they want to solve problems. And this is a you know problem that like, they want to see solved because uh, obviously it could have an impact on their business and their ability to respond quickly in the marketplace. And a lot of these businesses are, are ha already straddled with debt, already straddled with uh, you know, having to have reduced revenues during the pandemic, they're starting to see the light and starting to see recovery uh, and want to be able to, to persist on a very strong plan for growth. Uh, any disruption at any time for them uh, in the next few months is, is not going to be helpful to their businesses. And so that's why this Republican shutdown is even more detrimental to our small businesses because there's no time for further disruption when pandemic disrupted their lives so much. And it seems like from from that perspective, small businesses can't catch a break where, where you think back all the way to the pandemic or if you fast forward to this year and the number of different union negotiations that have taken place and strikes that have also meant that some of those small businesses don't have the same amount of paying customers that are coming through. And for now, as they're staring down a potential government shutdown where that funding could go in a different direction or just not be able to be dispersed to them. so. Where ultimately are we able to see a clear light at the end of the tunnel for these issues to be surpassed for small businesses and then for a clear runway for growth of small business in, in the U.S., especially as we look towards 2024 and hopefully many of these issues being in the rearview mirror? Yeah, well, just recently, the you know, Chamber of Commerce had had done you know, their optimism study and, and it was hopeful for small businesses. And as I said, they many of them are benefiting from not only the COVID relief that helped position them and help them survive during the pandemic. But, you know, they're going after investments in America, whether that's contracts and uh, helping us build our roads and bridges or uh, whether they're manufacturers or an innovation economy and are, are planning for the future. Uh, you know, they they have uh, strong hopes in the future. And that's, that's what they're, what's so amazing about our entrepreneurs in this country. And we've seen 13.6 million new business applications filed. Uh, these are businesses that we want to see survive. They're the job creators. Uh, they're the ones who are going to create the products and services for the future that'll make our economy globally competitive. And so uh, as we as we look to continue to try to build resilience 
within our small businesses. Uh, they've had to, as you can imagine, you know, plan for uh, so much disruption. You know, they've obviously had to be more agile, more, uh, you know, more efficient in their operations. But uh, again, there's only so much that they can sustain. And further disruption when it's unnecessary, when you know, we could um, actually see that this uh, that this you know, disruption, this shutdown, could affect them, but it could be solved. Uh, the Republicans you know, could take action. Uh, this is something that is you know, very alarming to our small businesses who don't want to see disruption when there could be problem solving instead. Administrator Guzman, just lastly, while we have you here, the FTC has sued Amazon for illegally maintaining monopoly power, the allegation that's come forward. We no doubt have heard many small businesses talk about the practices of Amazon over the years, but do small businesses want a breakup of Amazon? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue for sure, because we saw, especially during the pandemic, small businesses depending uh, on digital technologies, on, on, on key platforms to be able to build revenue. Uh, and get their products out the door when, when oftentimes retail and main streets were negatively affected. Uh, you know, being online also means opening up uh, to marketplaces abroad. And on a lot of these platforms, you see small businesses trading with multiple countries uh, and really building their businesses. So it's, 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 a, it's a challenging topic. Obviously, small businesses want to increasingly leverage digital e-commerce and take advantage of the more than $5 trillion digital e-commerce marketplace that is global. So, uh, you know, I know that small businesses will want to continue to have options to move forward. Clearly, uh, the FTC is, is moving forward with, uh, you know, investigating, making sure that there's no price gouging happening. But we, uh, we of course, want to see uh, small businesses continue to go digital, whatever that is platform or, or however they're able to most successfully do it. And we've stood up a, a platform for them to be able to find out about all the digital tools that are available to grow their businesses. Minister Guzman, it's been great to speak with you. Thanks so much for joining us here on Yahoo Finance this morning. Isabella Casillas Guzman, Administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. There are only three days left for Congress to pass a spending bill to keep the government from shutting down. The Senate reached a deal on a stopgap spending bill that, if passed, would keep the government funded until November 17th, while House Speaker McCarthy continues negotiations for his four full-year spending bills. The Senate's bill includes more than $6 billion in aid to Ukraine, which McCarthy has spoken out against. Meanwhile, McCarthy finally got to, to vote got the vote to bring his bills to the House floor for a debate. Our next guest has been at the negotiation table in Congress and is here to share his insight. Let's bring in former senator from North Dakota, Byron Dorgan. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So as someone who has, who's been in the room in these sorts of situations, when you look at what some of these GOP holdouts are asking for, how close are they to even averting a government shutdown? Or how long do you think this might persist, given how far apart they are? Well, it doesn't seem to me they're close at all. I mean, we have, uh, particularly in the U.S. House, we've got a, a few loudmouths that uh, care very much about trying to find a way to shut down the government. I mean, it's it's very bizarre. There's a, a kind of a profound ignorance here about uh, what this means to the American people, what it means to good government. And so, you know, in the past, uh, we, we had a, a Newt Gingrich shutdown some decades ago, and I was one of the negotiators uh, that was selected to negotiate and went to the White House almost every day during that period. And I, I can tell you, it's once the government is shut down, it's very hard to find a way to negotiate uh, and get it back. It's, you know, I mean, ultimately it'll happen, but uh, this is this is not a good thing for the American people to watch. Uh, you know, the Speaker does not control the House of Representatives any longer. And uh, the Senate, it looks like it's, it has done something that if they send it to the House and the House would pass it, would give us another four or five weeks, but then we'd right, be right back into it again. So my wish is that Congress would begin to behave in a way that uh, it used to behave, uh, do the right thing, uh, compromise. Um, you know, the lubrication of democracy has always been compromise. Uh, that's what they should do. Uh, Byron, I, I wonder if you can speak to that. You know, as somebody who has been at the negotiating table before with that clock ticking on a government shutdown, how is this current political environment different? And, and, and you know, how much optimism do you put, given that that we could, in fact, avert a shutdown? Well, the current political system is different than anything I've ever known, and it has to do with 
Donald Trump. It has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with uh, more tribal politics, you know, people more caring about uh, the political party they belong to than, than the question of the larger government issues. I, you know, I really wish that we would see both in the House and the U.S. Senate, people care a great deal more about good government than their political party. But that has not been the case. And uh, so I, my best guess is, and I don't know this for sure, but my best guess is it appears at the end of this week, we'll have another government shutdown. And the American people do not respect that which brings the government down. They respect uh, smart and good men and women in the Congress who would work together and find the right kind of compromises to move forward. And Byron, we know in these situations, there always does tend to be the blame game. We saw Speaker McCarthy said that a government shutdown would not be on House Republicans. But there was a morning consult poll of voters. 34% of them said Republicans in Congress would be mostly to blame for a government shutdown. 23% would blame President Biden. 21% would blame Democrats in Congress. So it seems, at least for, for the voting public, there'll be enough blame to go around. What is the incentive then for some of these GOP holdouts to keep this up? Well, there are no winners with respect to the shutdown of a government at all. Uh, and, you know, there will be blame cast all, all around. But there are some people who have come to the Congress who have said, you know what, uh, we don't like what's going on and we're willing to shut the government down if necessary. And so uh, some have boasted about being willing to do that. I, I think that's nothing to boast about. The American people deserve much, much better than they're getting, and particularly from the U.S. House. And I mentioned I shouldn't probably use the term loudmouth, but there are a few loudmouths in the U.S. House these days that are very different than the ones that I and many others have served with over decades. This naturally begs the question, you know, why are we back here where we are? Uh, we were talking yesterday about just how many government shutdowns there have been. Um, there is some movement within Congress to, to potentially sort of change that. You know, one bill that's being introduced here automatically provides continued appropriations if spending bills don't get enacted. Uh, there are a number of others that have been introduced as well. I mean, is it time to seriously consider something along those lines so that we're not back here a few months from now, a year from now? Well, much of this is about spending, as you know. And, uh, uh, so we'll see. I mean, there has to be uh, appropriations bills passed in both the House and the Senate and signed by the president. That represents the process by which the government has the funds to do what it uh, is, needs to do. So uh, we'll see. But I, I just, you know, again, there are people in the U.S. House, there's about uh, three dozen of them in the Freedom Caucus, maybe four, uh, who don't mind at all if there's a shutdown. They think it makes their case, whatever their case is these days. And uh, I, I think the American people really have lost a great deal of respect for the politics of the Congress and especially the politics in the U.S. House. The Speaker does not control the House these days. You, you remember he had, I think, 15 votes to become Speaker. So, you know, he has a difficult situation as well, but uh, he's making it more difficult by the kinds of things he's doing and by the leadership he's portrayed. And Byron, I do want to ask you, when you were negotiating, that was a three-week shutdown, you were negotiating with then-Speaker Newt Gingrich uh, during the Clinton administration. Now, that was a three-week shutdown. Given how much the economy has changed, how, what sort of repercussions can we expect when we try and get something back up and running when you have an economy as complex as this and as fast-moving as this? Well, th that was a three-week shutdown, and uh, we spent a great deal of time trying to think through and work through how do you how do you put this back up. But this, you know, this is a complicated system that we have these days. Things have become even more complicated. And I, w my best hope is that uh, if there is a shutdown, that it can be uh, relatively brief. But I wouldn't expect that to be the case, uh, given the fact that there's a completely different kind of politics in the U.S. House and in the U.S. Senate. The Senate is different these days. You, you've seen uh, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer come together. Republicans and Democrats in the Senate come together, at least in this circumstance, for I think a five-week extension uh, of a continuing resolution. So the Senate is behaving in a way that it should behave just to try to get this done. The House uh, is not doing that. And that has to do with the fact that there's precious little leadership there. And, and I, I wish that were not the case, but it is. And I worry very much okay. that if this shutdown exists, that we're going to be in a situation that's going to take a great deal of time to try to work through and find the compromises necessary to put it back up. 
Well, the clock's certainly ticking. We've got that shutdown watch on our screen there with just three days to go until that mm -hmm. deadline. Former Senator Byron Dorgan, it's good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. Nice to visit. Governor, let me just stay with you here. Someone that, you know, uh, has dealt with big budgets before and, and big numbers, you know, how would a shutdown impact how the U.S. economy is viewed? How damaging could this be? It could be very damaging if it goes on for uh, for a while. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we are the, the currency of the world, as it were, uh, and that probably won't change yet. But if we keep doing this, it will. Uh, there's a big difference between the last shutdown and this shutdown and in, in terms of other uh, currencies uh, becoming more and more uh, worldwide ex uh, accepted on a worldwide basis. It's probably not the yuan yet, uh, but certainly uh, the euro. And so I, this is going to be very damaging in the long term. Um, and it's just a, a product of our division. It's a product of people being felt left behind. It's a problem of one party playing on grievance politics. And, you know, I, I, I basically think the platform of of the Republican Party is hate and anger, and it's a pretty successful plat platform right now. Doctor, you know, when you think about the furloughs that would take place, the impact on FDA, EPA activities on food and water safety, what type of suspension of those operations would, would consumers also be rights to perhaps curtail some of their activity or perhaps just be more cognizant of, of where they are spending, where they are consuming, and, and making sure that, you know, not to kind of be fear-mongering here, but still recognizing what the real absence of some of those hazard investigations boards would mean. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because, again, I think, you know, it's not a joke to shut down the government. You know, it is, it, the political posturing has real impact on real people. And both FDA and EPA have said that uh, having to furlough their staff, right, the FDA is going to furlough one fifth of their staff by Sunday. Uh, the EPA has said that they won't be able to take on and review new, um, new investigations for permits under the Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the chemical safety and hazard board will suspend open investigations. All of this has an impact on our health. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that's up at September 30th that is also contentious and potentially has an impact on public health is, as you know, I work on specifically pandemic preparedness and the pandemic, uh, pandemic preparedness and all hazards authorization act, the PAPA reauthorization act is also up on September 30th. And the things that would be affected if parts of it are allowed to expire are hospital preparedness. And here we are at the end of a really long public health emergency. The question is, have we not learned a lesson to continue to try to invest in these things and to ensure there's continuity um, so that we're prepared for any new threats that come along? All right. Really appreciate the perspective and insights from you both. Howard Dean, former governor of Vermont, and Dr. Nahid Badelia, who is the founding director at Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. Thank you so much. Thank you. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy rejected the Senate's bipartisan stopgap spending bill on Wednesday night, likely increasing the chances of government shutdown this weekend. Meanwhile, McCarthy is working on getting a few holdouts from his party to agree to his spending bills. Amid all the back and forth, our next guest sees a 100% chance of the government shutting down this weekend. Joining us now is Douglas Holtz, Aiken, former Congressional Budget Officer, Director. Always great to get some time with you. Uh, Doug, uh, before we even really dig into the ramifications of a government shutdown, however long it might uh, extend, what is your takeaway from, from that GOP debate tonight? We've been talking to a lot of folks this morning. No real contender is sticking out, perhaps that fuels the hand of a Donald Trump, but uh, we'd love to get your take. Well, I think that is the right take. Um, th this was a debate that didn't move the needle very much. The, uh, Mr. Trump went in with a pretty large lead. Nobody separated themselves from the others on that stage. Uh, and, and really, it was more of the same. I think, you know, Nikki Haley continues to look strong and and uh, confident, but not gaining on Mr. Trump. And, and that's the real message out of the debate. Okay, so of what you heard in the debate, did anybody seem concerned about a shutdown? And why should they be? Uh, I did not hear a great concern about the shutdown. Um, I think the biggest reason to be concerned is this reinforces the view of the, the Fitch rating agency and others that the U.S. does not have the capability of managing its finances. And that's not a message that you want to send to global capital markets. And Doug, you said you see a 100 percent chance of a, of a shutdown. What is the probability on 
another credit rating for this country. And I think a lot of folks are trying to understand what are just continuing contentious uh, discussions like this around government shutdowns going back several years ago. What is it doing to the, the confidence in the U.S. financial system? Well, first of all, you know, I think the reason we're going to get the shutdown is pretty simple. If you look at the, the proposals so far, there's nothing that can pass the House with 218 Republican votes that will pass the Senate. So there's no path to, to, to law at this point. Uh, and the main reason for that is that there's no reason for Democrats to save the Republicans from themselves in the House the first time around. Once that happens, it's a very different story. Uh, so I don't expect a long shutdown. Uh, the, the government shuts down, and at that point, the Senate writes a bill that is uh, consistent with the White House's goals. Uh, it goes over to the House, and lots of Democrats vote for it. They jam it through, and the president signs it. So there, there's a path to funding the government with this with this hiccup. And so I don't think global investors are going to be terribly shaken by a two, three, one week uh, uh, shutdown. Uh, it's just not a good news story, but it's not terrifically bad news either. If we were to see a shutdown that lasted past a week, two weeks even, then who would be the biggest loser in that scenario? Well, I think the biggest loser in that scenario are uh, the U.S. troops. Uh, unlike past situations like this, there has been no provision to pay the troops during the shutdown. And it's a disgrace to not uh, take care of the U.S. military for those who are defending the values of this country. I, I view that as an enormous uh, error on the part of the Congress and, and something they should not be proud of. Then there's the, the sort of nuisance value for everybody in the United States. You, know, you can't renew your passport. Uh, if, if you needed flood insurance to uh, to close on your new home, you can't get the insurance policy, can't close on your home. Uh, there's just a slew of basic government services. Exporters can't get licenses, um, which which won't happen and which will interfere with the conduct of normal economic and, and personal affairs. Doug, at the heart of really this debate, I would argue is the, this fact, I and mean, this country just still has too much debt, and they continue to seemingly add at it at every single turn. How concerned are you about this country's debt? Very. Um, uh, this country has a, a, a real threat from the, the outlook for the federal budget, for fiscal policy. Uh, it is a good thing for there to be a discussion about the debt. It's high. It's rising. Under the, the current laws, uh, it, will, it will just continue to rise. And is, we're on an unsustainable trajectory. That's, that's the terrible thing. The bad news about this debate is it's focused on the wrong part of the budget. It's focused on the annual appropriations to fund the government. The real issue is entitlement spending. We'll spend $80 trillion over the next 10 years, if my old shop, the CBO, uh, is right. And of that, $50 trillion will be entitlement spending. Only $20 trillion will be the things they're fighting about right now. So the real issue is how do you make Medicare and Social Security financially sustainable over the long term? And I'll just point out, this isn't just uh, you know green eye shades uh, view of the world. If you're 55 and planning to retire in 10 years, you have no idea what your Social Security check is going to look like. You can't make a reasonable financial plan. That's disgraceful. Social Security is past due for getting fixed by the Congress. Medicare is the same thing. So uh, that's what the debate has to be. That's what I want to hear people on uh, a debate stage talking about in Simi Valley. That's what I want to hear the president talking about. And so far, his message has been, I'm not touching it. That's unacceptable. We only got 30 seconds left. Is there any elected official that you've heard put forward an actual solution when it comes to cutting into the national debt? Um, there is one person talking about reforming Social Security, and that's Senator Cassidy from Louisiana. Uh, he seems to be a quite lonely voice at this point. So uh, I hope the chorus rises in the, in the weeks and the months to come. Doug holtz Aiken, who is the former Congressional Budget Office Director. Thank you so much for taking the time here with us today. Certainly do appreciate Thank it. You. It's great to see you again. So let's talk about this deal that many, at least on Friday, weren't too optimistic that a deal was going to be able to get through Congress. We did see that. So how are you looking at what was reached and really what that signals here for the next six and a half weeks until that next deadline? Yeah, good morning. So, so look, my main point to clients has been we have expected a shutdown of the government in the fourth quarter and investors should not care. Our message to clients this morning has been the exact same. We still expect a shutdown in the fourth quarter and we don't think the client should care. And I think you perfectly summarized it in the beginning when you said, look, all we did is what DC does best, which is punt the hard decisions, punt the hard 
um, the hard bills to later on. And all we have here is a punt of the federal funding deadline to November 17th. Shauna Brett, we I haven't addressed any of the big issues. There's still fights over spending levels, over specific policies, and of course, over that Ukraine funding, which was the trickiest part of the whole thing for everyone to figure out over the weekend. And, and so with that said, Isaac, are there any significant portfolio moves that you're telling clients or, or that you would advise people to consider, given the fact that there are still larger policy decisions that have yet to kind of net out one way or the other here once we get to November? I'll tell you the one thing that scared me the most was that we wouldn't collect and report official government data during the shutdown. Um, I think, mm -hmm. obviously, we all know it's a pretty sensitive time for the Federal Reserve, and it's nice to have that gold-plated data coming out, things like the jobs report, of course, that we'll all be focused on. So that's point number one, is at least we've got six more weeks of that. Point number two is there are acute areas of, of, of policy concern that uh, have arisen with a government shutdown. So, for example, the National Flood Insurance Program. Had that lapsed, we would have been losing about 1,300 home sales a day. Right. And then the Small Business Administration would have pulled back on credit availability. So there are acute issues that that would have been delayed. But by and large, the biggest concern for me was that lack of gold plated data when the Fed continues to navigate these choppy waters. The government shutdown was averted, at least for now, with the government now being funded through November 17th. Will Congress be able to come to a compromise in just a little over 40 days? Well, we have a larger constitutional crisis on our hands. We want to bring in Steve Clemens, Semaphore founding editor at large. Steve, it's great to see you. So I guess your reaction to what played out over the weekend and what we could expect in the coming weeks. Lots of questions still. Well, we went from nail biting. I think we talked about this before about, you know, what were going to be the signals of how this might go. And I said, watch Matt Gates, watch Marjorie Taylor Greene, because their backbone in this is very strong. Their incentives you know, particularly Matt Gates, he's really thrown down the gauntlet to Leader McCarthy and kind of called it right. It ultimately essentially needed the Democrats to, to kind of bail out the nation. It's not just bail out Speaker McCarthy, but in fact, they came around and kind of showed how you could move to, you know, the side, these others. But, you know, we don't know what Kevin McCarthy's uh, going to have to pay the Democrats for this moment. Um, but it came down to the, you know, the wire on Saturday. We were all watching and this continuing resolution came out of nowhere. And I don't know if you, we, I was watching Dome Watch to look at the, you know, the, the votes as they were coming in, as they were coming in. And, and you could sort of see as they were swimming in overwhelming Democrats. And then a lot of Republicans came in. So that, those Republicans that came in are going to, um, you know, be the ones that are going to be the, the bulwark, if you will, of the moderate um, part of the Republican Party. But Matt Gates is furious right now. We're going to see what he does this week. I don't know that I've seen him happy before, Steve, quite frankly. Um, so now that he is I so furious. I saw him at a Barbie party once with his wife, and he looks really happy. Now. Yeah. Interesting. You know, We're going to need more detail on that in the future. <laughs> in the meantime, though, I mean, how, how expeditiously do you expect now some of the more upset kind of faction of the Republican Party to push for the ousting of Speaker McCarthy? Well... You mean Matt Gates is is uh, I mean I think he's thrown down the gauntlet this weekend. Of course, he said that you know in his conversation with Jake Tapper that this would happen this week, and he says he has the votes to at least uh, move the motion uh, to vacate to call. Of course, he can do it. You know, one member of the House can call for the motion to vacate, but now it will come down to something really interesting, and that's why we've already heard AOC come out and say she is not going to vote. Uh, to keep McCarthy in place. But but Nancy Pelosi is telling everyone, wait till you hear from Hakeem Jeffries, because Hakeem Jeffries and the speaker may work out something. We don't know what that would be, and we don't know what the price is that McCarthy would have to pay for Democrats, uh, some Democrats to support him. But it's a it's it's historic. I mean, we just never see moments like this where members of one party might, in fact, keep McCarthy in place, um, you know, of the opposition party. So we don't know, but 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 Gates is committed to bringing this action this week. Steve, what do you think the risk is here? Not only obviously to Speaker McCarthy and what this could mean for him personally, but more broadly speaking for the GOP party as we look ahead to 2024 and the dysfunction that we've seen play out over the last 
obviously several weeks, but really several months when we talk about this divide within the GOP. But parties in power have a hard time when they have thin margins. You know, I tell everybody when, when the Democrats had a 50-50 balance and they needed Kamala Harris, it gave Joe Manchin, Senator Manchin, enormous power. And in my book, Manchin used that power to bring the price tag of the IRA and the, uh, uh, you know, the Build Back Better package, which later became called the IRA, brought that all and, you know, essentially brought it down from $6 trillion where Bernie Sanders started to about half a billion, you know, or $500 billion. And so when you kind of look at that, he used that leverage in a way to kind of focus, if you will, and to also limit government spending. What you're seeing now are Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and the others that, that uh, Speaker McCarthy has put on the Rules Committee and others, given them enormous power in the deal to become Speaker after 15 ballots, remember, when he was elected. And they are now using that same kind of leverage. But sometimes, you know, sometimes it's for their own personal issues and sometimes it's for genuine concerns about fiscal responsibility, Ukraine funding or other things. But I think right now the Republican Party is in the midst of a civil war. But remember, the Democrats had Nancy Pelosi. We haven't seen Hakeem Jeffries in the majority yet, but he's got different wings in his party, too, that can be very dramatic. So these tensions inside parties are not just inside the Republican Party. It can happen with the Dems, too. But when you're in government and you're responsible, um, it's it's a very, very tough case if you, if you don't have enough votes to get around the minority with all this power that's constantly threatening to defect. Yeah, Steve, uh, you know, when we think about how big of a deal this could be again in November, we were speaking with Isaac Boltanski from BTIG earlier in the show, and, and he was remarking on some of the larger policies that had not been netted out as a result of uh, just passing a stopgap funding bill here. So how much more pain could we see potentially economically even uh, if we were to continue to look at November now and, and have to evaluate whether or not there will be a deal at that juncture? Well, look, I mean, I think when you don't pass appropriations bills and you don't have democracy working to, to generate the appropriations bills to appropriately and craft and sculpt the way in which taxpayer dollars are being spent to move the interests of the nation forward as agreed within our democratic process, then you're really undermining that. But we haven't we haven't played that well in a very, very long time, not just now. I think the bigger interesting things are Moody's and Fitch's basically sending the signal that they're going to begin downgrading um, you know, the the not you know the treasury assets and whatnot of the nation, you know, the bonds, because they see a governance challenge and governance problem that plays out over and over and over again. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I do think that there's no easy story here that gets better on November 17th. We'll see if both sides are able to come together. We'll see um, if Kevin McCarthy will survive that long in his rule. And we will see whether any of those, you know, 10 to 20, um, you know, Freedom uh, uh, Caucus members that are you know, driving a hard bargain for their support are going to be more satisfied with McCarthy by November 17th. Otherwise, we may see the showdown all again. All right. Well, moving on, the race is heating up among House Republicans to become the next House Speaker. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise and Congressman Jim Jordan are the first to throw their hats in the ring. But our next guest is raising the concern that no matter who takes the GAVA, it will be a difficult task to get consensus on key issues, including spending, as the government faces another threat of a shutdown next week. Joining us now is Jeanette Lowe, Strategist, Securities Policy Research Managing Director. So, Jeanette, thank you so much for joining us. The race for the speakership is on here. Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, do you have a, a, a horse in that race? Do you have bets you would place? And I guess the bigger question, would it actually matter here if it was Scalise or Jordan? Big differences between those two? So there are differences um, that with terms of who may be a little bit more conservative and who might be a little bit more moderate and who might be able to get more of the votes um, from either side within the Republican caucus. But the issue is, is that, you know, right now, McCarthy was the person who probably could have gotten the most votes out of the Republican caucus. So now one of these other individuals has to figure out how they can wrangle the most votes to then ultimately win that speakership. You know, I think there are concerns on, on different sides about certain issues, you know, maybe Scalise still has, you know, going through cancer treatments and you have Jim Jordan um, being a little bit more conservative. 
So I think that they people are going to have to figure that out. But for us, the bigger issue right now is, you know, that Speaker McCarthy was deposed yesterday. The House is not going to come back until next Tuesday, which means an entire week is now being lost where we're not actually even working on any of the budget issues that were going to potentially cause a government shutdown four days ago. And we don't necessarily know how easy this speaker vote may be. It could be that it's quite chaotic, similar to what McCarthy faced in January. And that dysfunction is starting to play into the markets. And we're starting to see people being a little bit more worried about whether or not policymakers are actually able to keep the government functioning. Um, that is definitely appears to be a concern. I mean, so what's the answer then to that? Are we going to get that shutdown, especially with that lost time and especially with the pressure from the right wing of the party that caused the McCarthy to be um, removed in the first place? Right, exactly. So there's nothing that's really changed in the Republican caucus except the fact that McCarthy is no longer the head of it. So whoever takes over as speaker really still has to wrangle what to do with this very tight majority, how to wrangle with the moderate concerns, with the conservative concerns, and then figure out how to go forward from there. So there may be some horse trading to actually get the votes for the speakership, and maybe that will ultimately get us a deal that comes through. You know, if we think back to what happened in 2015 when Boehner stepped down as speaker, Paul Ryan actually was able to pass a budget deal that Boehner never was able to do so. So a new speaker may come in with some political capital and may be able to move us forward. But at the same time, what we're seeing right now doesn't give us a whole lot of confidence as we're looking forward to November 17th and the fact that we might still have another government shutdown. At that point, we're not really seeing any change yet on how do you solve the budget issues? How do you solve what are we going to do about the Ukraine funding and other fiscal priorities? And all of this is happening at the same time that we're seeing you know, slow down in the consumer, um, slower uh, labor market growth. Uh, you're seeing issues with the debt costs as we continue to see higher debt, um, higher debt servicing costs because of higher interest rates. And that's putting even more pressure on the budget as well. And I think investors in particular are really starting to just look at what is going on in Washington and starting to be a little bit uncomfortable about whether or not policymakers are actually going to be able to handle these issues as they come due. And that's something that is going to be continue to put pressure, I think, especially on bond yields. And Jeanette, so lots of moving parts here. If this does perhaps increase the risk of a government shutdown, do you think that also increases the risk of a Moody's downgrade? Right. So we have been concerned that if they, we had seen a government shutdown in the current month, that Moody's may potentially put the U.S. on a credit ratings watch. The Monday before we were potentially going into a shutdown, so last Monday, Moody's actually did say that they may intentionally do so because of a government shutdown, because the credit rating agencies have been more focused on process rather than finances. And if this speakership vote, again, takes a long time, if we continue to see a lot of dysfunction, if the House is still not able to move forward any bill in the House to actually pass a budget, or maybe they are, but they can't pass anything that's actually going to be able to go through the Senate, that might put Moody's back into play and have them continue to think about whether or not they should put the U.S. on credit watch. Again, particularly as we're looking at U.S. debt rising, uh, net interest costs continuing to go up. And so that is a concern for us in particular. And the more dysfunction we see, we think that probability increases. You know, and that seems to be more of a concern of markets as well, not just the Moody's, but the, the debt servicing costs that you referred to. And in your notes to us, you used a word uh, to a potential word to apply to the U.S. that I haven't seen in a long time. And that word is austerity. Um, we have not seen either party really enact anything resembling true austerity in a very long time. Is there any actual potential for that? Yeah, so we have been looking historically at what happens when you have rising net interest costs. And, you know, we have been in this period of fiscal stimulus for about 25 years now um, where you could raise spending, you could cut taxes, and you weren't really seeing a big impact on U.S. debt servicing costs. That is all changing now after the inflation that we've had and the Fed's having to raise interest rates and now hold them there. So what we are now seeing is that we have net interest costs at above 14% of tax revenues. Historically, we have seen that that has been the threshold 
that once you reach above that level, that is where the U.S. starts to move from a period of stimulus to a period of austerity. And so that is what we are looking to see. We don't think it's going to flip on immediately, but that is something that is now moving forward. The one thing that complicates this a little bit is the 2024 election. So policymakers tend to not want to impose fiscal austerity ahead of an election because people want to get reelected. But the issues are coming due. And so this is something that policymakers are going to have to take into consideration. They may not move before the 2024 election. But the other big issue is that when we get into 2025, we potentially have a new president, potentially have Biden still at the helm. There are all of the individual tax cuts that were passed as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Those all expire at the end of 2025, too. So there will also be another fiscal cliff coming that kind of adds into all of this, all of these dynamics. Jeanette, thank you for joining us today. That was great. We appreciate it. That was Jeanette Lowe from Strategus. Lawmakers have until mid-November to reach a deal to keep the government open. And without a speaker at the helm, the House can't move forward on any spending bills. Rating agency Moody's previously warned that a government shutdown could put pressure on the U.S. credit. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us now with why a credit downgrade is still worth keeping on your radar. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Uh, well, first of all, it seems possibly more likely than before that we are going to have a government shutdown in November. Uh, the political analysts I've been following on this say it's very hard to see how Congress is going to get all the bills finished that need to fund the government. I re remember, the House at the moment is basically not functioning. Uh, and even if it does get a speaker, all the dynamics that we saw leading up to the chaos of the last week are, are likely to remain in place. And Moody's has already warned that if there is a government shutdown, it could be the third uh, rating agency to lower the U.S. credit rating from the AAA uh, level, the best there is, that the United States has enjoyed for most of its history until uh, recent times. Uh, and all of the, you know, so Standard & Poor's has downgraded the United States, that went all the way back to 2011. Fitch downgraded uh, the United States earlier this year. And the problem is not the credit worthiness of the U.S. government. All of these rating agencies keep pointing out the problem is political. Uh, it's that it's that lawmakers and policymakers simply cannot um, cannot run the country in a coherent fashion. And this almost always lands on Republicans. It is Republicans who are the ones who are threatening not to pay, uh, you know, thirty three tr trillion dollars in U.S. debt. It's Republicans who are always doing uh, the shutdown theatrics. And this is starting to matter. I mean, this rise in um, interest rates and bond rates that we've been talking about during the last several weeks are related to the size of the U.S. debt and to probably related to, to um, the situation with the credit rating of the United States. And it's beginning to look like you can say that higher interest rates, which are costing Americans money through more expensive mortgages, car loans, and so on, uh, part of that is because of these idiots in Washington. So uh, these politicians who cannot get the job done, almost all of them Republicans, are starting to cost ordinary people money, and we need to turn this around. Rick, talk about a little bit more about what this exactly could mean for investors, because I think a lot of people largely brushed it off just in terms of the risks there. But if we do see a government shutdown, if we do see a downgrade here in the credit rating, just what the possible implications of that are? It, it does not have um, di direct implications for most things um, investors mm -hmm. care about. I mean, I mean, it's it's not like the stock market is going to tank uh, the day after uh, Moody's becomes the third rating agency to lower the U.S. credit rating. But everybody is now talking about what's happening in the bond market. And the, and the bond market does not announce why interest rates are going up exactly. But it's very clear that we are seeing interest rates going up no longer uh, because the Federal Reserve is pushing short-term short rates up. Interest rates are going up. Uh, medium and long-term rates are going up for other reasons. And it's not, it's probably not one simple thing. Um, we do not know if this is uh, sort of permanent, temporary, what's going on, but it is probably the case. And you know, you're just starting to hear people trying to figure this out. It's probably the case that high levels of US uh, public debt and the problems, the political problems in Washington that could lead to another downgrade are part of the reason that medium and long-term interest rates are going up again. This is the mortgages. We've got mortgages now over 7%. 
uh, we have had medium and long-term rates going up by more than short-term rates uh, f uh, for the last several months. So it's not the Fed anymore. It is other factors that are affecting the bond market. And it does seem like the so-called bond market vigilantes have, who have been asleep for the last 20 years are starting to wake up. Nine Republicans have announced their intention to seek the speakership as a deeply divided House GOP failed last week to elect a new leader. A forum for the hopeful candidates will be held later today and a vote to narrow down the list is scheduled for Tuesday. No bills, including President Biden's $106 billion aid request for Ukraine and Israel can pass the House without a speaker in place, and House Republicans remain deeply divided. Joining us now, I want to bring in Steph Knight, Axios politics reporter. Steph, it's good to see you. So now we have nine Republican, nine GOP members throwing their hat in the ring, going for a House speaker. Give us a sense just in terms of how their, where their support lies and also just what this means. If we are any closer, it doesn't sound like it, to eventually getting a speaker for the House. I mean, you look at the fact that we do have nine different candidates who have thrown their names in, and it, it does go to show just how far we are from having a consens consensus candidate for speaker at this point in time. Of course, this comes on the heels of two failed speaker bids by you know Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan. And now it seems that everyone feels like they have an opportunity to try for the speakership. And you know, according to our reporting discussions with some of our Republican sources, there are definitely some members within that nine who are more likely. Of course, majority whip Tom Emmer is considered one of the likely candidates. But even Byron Donalds, who's a relatively newer, younger member of Congress, um, he is also considered to have a pretty serious um, opportunity here, given the fact that he is often sided with some of the more conservative side of the party um, this year. He was one of those who withheld his vote from Speaker McCarthy initially, then Speaker McCarthy initially in January. So there are just so many names. We'll have to see how this shakes out. But it does go to show just how you know chaotic this process has really become. So this also is going to loom large, especially as we are just days away, well, just about a, a week outside of the beginning of November. And of course, in November, that's the potential deadline for the government shutdown, not just the potential deadline. It is the deadline. Uh, and so what does this make, you know, how much more difficult does this make actually getting to and through a resolution once we get to that date? Well, exactly. As you point out, there are so many things that are on the agenda that the House has to get done. Of course, funding the government or coming up with some kind of a short term solution to push that deadline back like they did last time, you know, a process that led to the ouster of Kevin McCarthy as speaker. They also are now being presented with they were presented last week with the White House's one hundred and six billion dollar package, which includes aid to Ukraine and Israel, as well as significant border security funding. That is obviously a top priority for many members in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, who view this time as a critical moment for the U.S. to be supporting our allies in Ukraine, in Israel. And of course, we've also continued to see the border issue become a focus from Republicans, but also the Biden administration. So there are some big ticket items on the agenda for the House. And it's something that they need a leader, a speaker in place for, whether that is a new speaker speaker who gets elected in the next few days or whether we ultimately see Republicans have to work with Democrats to empower the, the current speaker pro tempore, McHenry, Patrick McHenry. Welcome back. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. We are live from the Nasdaq market site and it is official. Representative Mike Johnson is the new Republican Speaker of the House and with less than a month to work out a budgeting deal to avoid a government shutdown, the new leader has a lot to get working on. But who is this congressman from Louisiana? How did he get here? And what does it mean for the House? Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us with what's keeping him up at night and what's worth <laughs> keeping on your radar. <laughs> Rick, sorry, I added in a little line there, but I That's imagine okay. this has been keeping you up at night a fair bit. Uh, well, I get some sleep now that there's actually a speaker. Uh, you don't <laughs> have to follow the, the, the speaker follies uh, every day, but we'll see how long that lasts. So. Uh, Mike Johnson is more conservative than the last speaker, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he, uh, he, he wants to cut, uh, to cut spending along with some of the other hardline Republicans. Uh, he has opposed aid to Ukraine. 
Um, and, and we're going to find out <clears throat> within a few weeks whether he becomes a little more pragmatic and a little more moderate now that he actually has to get business done in the House. Uh, he probably will be. Um, because w when you're a lesser known member of Congress, it's easier to um, make controversial votes. I mean, for example, he's an election denier. He uh, he voted against certifying President Biden uh, after the 22 election, which Biden obviously won. Um, and he didn't catch a lot of flack for that. I mean, he wasn't one of the main people either for or against the cause. Um, but now, uh, you know, reporters in the Washington Press Corps are asking him about it. He has to answer. He has to answer for it. He hasn't. Um, so that that's the main question. I mean, what we've seen uh, during the last month is that the uh, the Trump or the hard right faction in the Republican Party, it sort of has blocking power or veto power, if you will. They can stop stuff from happening, but there aren't enough of them to actually make their own agenda happen. So. That's where that's where we are. And uh, look, in order to pass budgeting bills in the House, get aid for Ukraine, for Israel, these other things, uh, parties have to compromise. I mean, this is this is the way Congress works. Parties do have to compromise. So that's the big question. Is he going to find a way to compromise with Democrats because he, he's going to need some of their votes? Or is, is he just going to be kowtowing to this small but um, veto minority that Republicans have? Um, which means he could end up defenestrated just like Kevin McCarthy did by some point next year. Rick, you mentioned that he was one of the uh, election deniers. Just in terms of where he, has stand, where he has stood on other policy issues, how that then could potentially shape what we see coming out of the House here over the coming year. I guess, how do you see that potentially playing out and how that could then maybe ultimately affect in some way uh, 2024? He's extremely conservative on social issues, uh, such as abortion uh, and things related to that. That doesn't affect markets so much. Um, I, I guess the thing that um, our audience will want to care about is um, he does want uh, aggressive sp uh, government spending cuts, more than uh, Democrats and Republicans agreed to last June when we had that fight over uh, over the debt ceiling. So. Uh, is he really going to push for that? Um, and remember, um, Democrats control the Senate. <laughs> so even if he gets Republican uh, legislation approved in the House, a, sent, uh, a Democratic-controlled Senate is not going to approve it. And then what do you do? Uh, I mean, the Democrat-controlled Senate is not going to sign off on aggressive spending cuts. Uh, so um, are we going to have some kind of gridlock? Are we, are, are we just going to have repetitive threats of a government shutdown, and then everybody has to scramble to figure out what does that mean. Probably doesn't hurt markets too bad after a couple for just a couple of weeks, but what if it goes longer? Or will we have some semblance of normalcy in Washington for a little while? I think that is that's the big unanswered question at this point. Certainly, is the unanswered question. All right, Rick, always great to get your perspective. And now we're going to let you maybe catch up on a little more sleep, like Brad alluded to at the top there. Rick, thanks. I need so to much. do. Bye, guys. Shutdown averted. Well, almost. House lawmakers have passed the Republicans' plan to fund the government through early next year. The vote at 336 to 95, just ahead of Friday's deadline. Now, the vote was largely carried by Democrats as Republicans remain divided over government spending levels. The deal now heads to the Senate, which is widely expected to pass the legislation. We have heard from uh, Democratic leadership within the Senate that they do largely support this bill and passing this bill. When it comes to what is included in this measure, it pretty much extends the funding at current levels right now, pushing out some of those uh, more contentious fights, more contentious issues when it comes to border security, when it comes to federal spending levels, Ukraine funding. So yes, this will help us avoid a government shutdown at the end of this week, but really once again, just kicking the can down the road until we address some of those more sticky issues and many of those issues being why we're in this place right now. Yeah, laddered continuing resolution. We told our viewers at the beginning of the week that they were going to get a crash course in exactly what that meant, and that's exactly what we got. And ultimately, January 19th and now I think February 2nd are going to be the two dates that we have to continue to look at once we get into 2024. But you notice what is taking place within the Beltway now. Mike Johnson, the majority leader in the House, at least, he is trying to assuage many uh, of the con congressional members that he can reach across party lines and, and get a deal done. However, that might come at a risk of upsetting some of the people who previously voted out 
former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. So uh, that is something that's going to be interesting to continue to watch play out as well as part of this more broadly. And Johnson saying yesterday that he believes that he can fight on principle and do these things simultaneously when you have a small majority of requires some things are going to have to be bipartisan. So we'll see what the House is able to push forward here as we look ahead to 2024. The new government funding bill is officially heading to President Biden's desk. The Senate voted 87 to 11 to move the bill forward ahead of Friday's deadline. The short-term agreement, however, only gives Congress a few months to come to a longer-term solution here. And so now, as we continue to march towards January and then a Again, once in this latter continuing resolution, February, we'll see exactly where some of the more kind of uh, contentious elements of this debate will continue to move forward as well. Yeah, this essentially just kicks a can down the yeah. road. And in two months from now, we're going to be having the same sort of discussion in terms of what the GOP wants. They obviously want uh, more extensive cuts in terms of the funding and spending plans compared to what uh, the Biden administration laid out earlier this year. But I think this really shows that the GOP felt some pressure. They didn't want to be blamed for a shutdown ahead of 2024. They were able to kind of come to an agreement here, agree on this short-term plan in order to keep the government funded and look ahead to maybe some of the negotiations or some of the, uh, hopefully, at least from their point of view, as some of the things that, that the Democrats would maybe be able to come to some sort of an agreement on in terms of what they see, what they would be able uh, willing to uh, give into versus not. But again, it's more of the sticky points when it comes to funding going forward when it comes to building wall, when it comes to immigration, those are the sticking points that many of the far right leaning members of the conservative party were taking issue with when you take a look at the plans that were put forward uh, by McCarthy uh, several weeks ago and then still not included obviously in the plan that was just passed uh, this week. So looking ahead, we're gonna be having a very similar uh, sort of conversation, whether or not the GOP is able to get any sort of uh, restrictions in place for spending that they want will be tough given the fact that they have such a narrow leadership in the House and Senate obviously so controlled uh, by Democrats. But we'll see whether or not they're able to uh, make some sort of negotiation agreement. Yeah, just trying to kind of pass this through to what the markets might think of this as well here. The markets perhaps could look at this as, and this attempt and ultimately being able to get this to the president's desk, get it signed, and then ultimately, even if we are just kicking the can down the road, still looking at this as the potential in the future for this to perhaps be a, a sideline type of issue that doesn't drive the VIX back to the high teens like we were at when we were getting towards the deadline back in October now. And so all of that considered, perhaps the markets can look at this and find at least some sigh of relief that maybe it won't be as much of a continued uh, and these things continue to always come up again and again and again, regardless of who's in the office, who controls the balance of power. But at the end of the day, if the markets can sideline this as a headwind risk, potentially we'll see a little bit less volatility on any continuing negotiations that need to take place. Yeah, and it seems like at least this time around, many investors were looking past this potential yeah. deadline, right? We talk about the fact that this is a subject that has come up time and time again. The markets almost seem used to it. They weren't too worried about the fact that maybe we wouldn't be able to get an agreement before the deadline line tomorrow, but certainly we have gotten an agreement, but we're going to be having the same discussion before January 19th.